Sharky, don't call me Sharky. Your microphones are live. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. At this time, would everyone rise? And uh, Clarice, uh, Clarice Setzer, would you please come forward from the United Methodist Church and uh, give us the invocation, please? Good morning. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this wonderful and beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to serve in this community. We ask that you would bless all of the council members and the, and the mayor and all of those who serve faithfully in this community. We ask you this morning to guide the hearts and the minds of those who lead this council, direct your path, direct our path so that all may be served in this community. And God, we also ask that you would watch over and bless all of the military men and women who serve around the world. We ask you to bless their families, protect them as they serve for our, for our, in, our, in our nation's behalf. We thank you for all of this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Councilman Slack, uh, could you leave some Pledge of Allegiance, please? No, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilman McIntosh? Here. Councilwoman Martin? Here. Councilman Slackta? Here. Mayor Nelson? Here. Councilman Simmons? Here. Councilwoman Simons? Here. Councilman Longcart? Here. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mayor. All right. Uh, this morning, uh, let's go right on to public comment on agenda items. And this is a uh, public comment on agenda items only, please. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Mayor, sir. Uh, Council. Uh, it's such a privilege to live in a country that we hire by our votes representatives, people to represent our opinions. Um, I guess the Roman Empire was a pure democracy. We are a representative democracy where um, we hire a few individuals to represent the whole. Um, Government, unfortunately, and that is, becomes a monopoly. Um, unfortunately, power corrupts, and, and after a while, power becomes more corruptible. Uh, we write rules to try and discipline ourselves, uh, which reading the rules uh, uh, that are put upon the people in the, in the, on the council and the mayor makes it awfully hard to use the passion and have the passion that comes along with the desire to represent the people of Bonita Springs. Uh, I hope we don't stifle uh, freedom of speech, although we do need organization. And uh, I'm sort of disappointed in 9B that, it's, that we have to do our laundry in public. Uh, I hope we can be loving and understanding. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning uh, my name is Deborah Giambo, and my comments are also in regard to agenda item 9B, the question of reprimanding or censuring Mar Council Member Simons. I was reading the agenda for this meeting, and I was shocked to find this agenda item. My outrage prompted me to make special arrangements at work to be here, and I will have to leave shortly after my comments to go back there. From my experience at council meetings and viewing meetings on TV, more than I'd like to admit that I've actually seen, um, I would like to offer the following observations and comments. Council Member Simons has consistently shown herself to be a dedicated, engaged, and well-informed representative of the citizens of Bonita Springs. It is my observation that she consistently asks, asks persistent, important questions about each issue and remains engaged in every discussion. Contrary to the accusations in the supporting document for this agenda item, on various occasions when Council Mi Member Simons was engaged and asking pertinent questions, it was my observation that it was she who was frequently interrupted. Council Member Simons consistently reveals in her questions and comments that she has a background on whatever the discussion is about, indicating that she has taken her time to research and study the issues pertaining to the discussion. 
What is the reason behind this accusation? Is it to silence Councilmember Simons, to make her fit into some sort of cookie cutter mold of a complacent council member? In reviewing the supporting document for the agenda item, it seems clear that the majority of the reasons provided for this agenda item indicate that she was in fact engaged and dedicated. Her behavior in the meetings I have observed gives me hope for the democratic process in this country if all elected public officials took the interest and did the work to, required to participate the way she does prior to and during meetings. We citizens are certainly getting our money's worth with Council Member Simons. I would like to remember Council Members that Council Member Simons was elected and re-elected by the citizens in her district without paid staff to help that happen. She was supported by her constituents in the past and we are ready to mobilize to support her again. We citizens of this city should feel honored that Council Member Simons is willing to dedicate her time, her intelligence and energies to make this city a better place in spite of the difficulties that come along with it. Her level of dedication is rare among today's elected officials who seem to put their own agendas and personal interests before those of the citizens and the community. With the hard economic times that this country is going through and this city as well, it is shameful that the council de dedicates time to consider censure or reprimand of such a dedicated council member. Council member Simons is one of the good leaders dedicated to the citizens of this city and I respectfully urge you to vote against reprimand or censure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. William Simons. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Nobody knows Martha better than I do. Martha and I have been together for 24 years. In that time, and one of the reasons I love her is she doesn't like injustice. She cares and wants to help the underdog, and she always and she doesn't always have popular opinions. But she has supported you, Mayor, in every election and has helped you when you ask for help. I am very disappointed and hurt, and I know she is too. My wife is a wonderful woman. We have both sacrificed a lot for her to serve this city. This is not the thanks she deserves or the kind of action we expected from this council. This brings a bad mark on our city and does not build, build up, but tears down. This is the kind of process we will discourage other people from running, good people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Council members, Bob Bachman, current president of Bonita Springs Utilities. I'm here to ask your support for the uh, service, spatial service charge for a portion of IBE. Uh, this is uh, a community here that has asked the utility to take over maintenance of their internal wastewater collection system. Bob, it's, could you speak a little closer to the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a part of the ongoing mission of the utility to assume operation of these uh, systems. We've taken over approximately 40 package plants in the past, uh, converted 5,000 septic systems, and this particular system has uh, been a customer of the utility for a number of years after we took over the plant, but we have not maintained the uh, internal plumbing system. Uh, it has a need for some updating, uh, thus the, the request for the special service charge. These charges are assessed to the individual homeowners there, uh, pay for the improvements, and don't impact the other members of the utility. Uh, it also will help reduce the uh, uh, costs uh, to some extent of operating the, the utility and that will uh, stop intrusion into the system that has to get processed with the system. It helps the environment by uh, reducing um, discharge into this into the environment and we respectfully request your support thank, thank you. you sir next speaker please <coughs> morning uh, city council uh, mayor uh, Fred Forbes for the record uh, my father told me <laughs> never make judgment until you walk a couple miles in the moccasins of the people that have to make the judgment. 
Uh, I'm here today as a, uh, call it a friend of the council. I, I consider everyone on this council great council people. I think you all try and do a good job. You don't always agree. You don't always agree with me. <laughs> but that's fine. That's, that's what uh, government's all about. I would urge you to be careful about any kind of a formal public uh, censure, reprimand. I think it's a bad precedence for this council or any city council to take. I know that it, uh, whatever led to bringing it on the agenda, <coughs> it was discussed and considered seriously. But I would say that um, if, if you would do this, I believe it would create a bad precedence. I think it would hurt the image of the council. And I, I don't even know if any other cities in Lee County have done such a thing. But I, don't, I think it would have long-term and, and mid and short-term negative effects. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to speak? Please come forward. Good morning, Mayor morning. Ben Nelson. Good morning, uh, board members of the City of Council. My name is Juan Romero. I live here in Bonita Springs for more than 25 years. I'm uh, living in uh, Mrs. Marta, um, where he, she's re representing me. I can mention a lot of things, a lot of projects we have been working together, not just with her, but with the city council, um, sports, activities who they are benefit our community. Uh, Marta has been very helpful. Uh, whenever we have uh, any situation, any concerns, questions, or projects we want to do, we're approaching her. She always come, and no matter what time or what day it is, she's always working hard for the community for the well-being of us. I don't know and don't understand why is proposing to represent her publicly. I think we have, I prefer to be here to recognize her work because always she has been doing a really good job. And uh, you know, this is really something it bothers us very much, not just me, but all the associates on the soccer complex, the soccer fields, basketball, and all my community, Spanish community supporting very much the work is Marta Simmons doing all the time. And I've seen a few things it's mentioning about she's getting involved. But we're asking her to, to be the voice of the people who can not be here. Like anybody else, me, I got to go work today and uh, attending and supporting my family. But today is a very important day for us to come and talk and supporting her because I feel, again, she's a good representative she's working hard is any of you in the in the city council you know this is a nice city and a nice community and i think it's because the hard work of every one of you including mrs simons so please think about do this because i think it's it's not just represent representing repre her it's representing in us too it's a community and i think i don't think it's fair thank you thank you sir Anyone else this time? Please come forward. Good morning. My name is Bruce Fields. I represent uh, the village and IBE. Uh, it's a pleasure to come before the council this morning. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity. I want to speak on behalf of the, uh, the BSU petition uh, for the sewer system and the tariff issue. Uh, we. Uh, we, the members of, of the village, uh, took a vote last at the annual meeting uh, in last January, and it was 100% uh, in favor of, of this issue. So uh, on the behalf of IBE Village, uh, again, we ask for your support. I don't know whether you uh, allow the members from IBE that have attended the meeting to uh, to stand in support uh, if you do allow that. I'll, I'll take your word for it. How about that? <laughs> OK. There are several <laughs> here. So anyway, we'd like to thank the council, and we certainly ask you for your support. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Well done. Next uh, speaker, please. Good morning. Deb Harrop, Bonita Springs. 
Um, I'd also like to speak to the uh, green sheet item regarding the discussion of a censure of Martha Simons. Um, it's really disappointing to see this on a green sheet. I don't think it reflects well on the leadership and management of the city, especially at a time when confidence in the city is uh, probably at an all-time low. Um, I have to say I'd like to uh, endorse fully all the positive statements made by the prior speakers about Mrs. Simons and her performance as uh, re representing uh, the members, uh, the uh, 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 residents of her district. Um, she's not my representative. I'm not in her district. Um, however, everyone I've spoken to in her district in the city has spoken, has just spoken glowing in glowing terms about her. And my own impression of seeing her participate here is, is exactly what I would like to see. The style, uh, style issues are one thing, but substance is uh, incredibly important. And, um, you know, before uh, what may be a witch hunt begins, I'd like to personally say thank you very much for fully participating in the council meetings as specified in the code of conduct. And um, Mr. Mayor, I had to laugh at your use of the prose comment, quote unquote, your concern over the, quote unquote, the free exchange of ideas that we so cherish, because a public censure of one's colleague is certainly not the way to go about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please come forward. William Lewis Benita. I write the newsletter, Let's Talk Benita Politics. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I understand that this is the second woman that you brought up on charges. The first, Barbara Barnes Buchanan, you remember her. Gary Price fired her right here. While the rest sat in a cloak of silence. And after he fired her in front of the cameras, he left, leaving you and Councilman Spear on a feeding frenzy. Now, it's a coincidence, I understand it. Now it's two women. Okay, fine. There's 14 charges, 13 of which I personally believe is bogus. Yes, the lady talks too much, but you're in charge. You could say, stop. Enough, you've said it, let's go on. But you didn't do that. Or if you did do it, it was a weak attempt. But okay. Now, one of the charges was that the staff complained that she bothered them. Who on the staff complained? Do you wish to mention that party? Rumor has it that it was Miss Perino. Now that's a rumor. But she's so overworked as the director of parks that no one visits, but that's okay. But if it's true, why is the staff so up in arms about someone? coming and asking questions. Too many questions? Okay. But that's another matter, and that's one of the charges. I, for one, am against what you're doing under the cameras. Getting back to Miss Buchanan, it ruined the woman's life. She could never get a job. Okay, that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm against what you're doing. Okay, simple. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. Good morning. Bob Hilliard, a resident of Bonita Springs for seven and a half years. 
immediate past president at Bonita Springs Lions Club, current district manager for Lions International for Florida and the Bahamas. Martha Simons is a dedicated councilwoman. She's also a dedicated lion. As lions, our motto is we serve. But there's a category that goes along with that, but not without each other. If we can't work together, we're not going to accomplish those goals that we need to accomplish. Lions Clubs International is the largest charitable organization in the world with over 1.3 million members in over 200 countries. Most people think that the Red Cross are the first ones on the scene. Not true. The Lions are. <clears throat> and Lion Martha Simons at the Bonita Springs Lions Club has worked very diligently to see that those people in need in our local communities are served. And in the same capacity as a council member, she does the same thing to serve her constituents in this city. I come to you today in affirmation of this woman's ability, her dedication, and I ask you to drop this uh, censure item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else this time? Please come forward. Uh, yes, uh, Alex Grant, 11851 East Terry Street, former city council member, uh, and uh, I was on the original city charter committee. Uh, one thing is, uh, unless there's a criminal charge involved, as far as Martha Simons is concerned, then I believe a censure is out of order. Uh, if there are any problems like that, then there's the recall by the people of that council person. So that's, that's your uh, way of handling that. that. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to uh, speak on item uh, 9B. Uh, that's the uh, 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 on impact fees by resolution. While this may be easier to do, I prefer this to be done more laboriously by ordinance for a better public discourse where these impact fees are going to be. I want to see impact fees going only to things I can see, touch, smell. Uh, case in point, impact fees in an econ for economic development area should be used only for such things as stormwater infrastructure, police station, library, city hall, riprap along the river uh, that, uh, that where the city boundaries are. Uh, uh, impact fees should not be used for salary benefits or any uh, or, or anything else like that for of economic development pro uh, uh, programs. You don't want to be like Bonita Springs Fire Control and Rescue District, who uh, in 2000 between 2004 and 2009 collected excess monies and impact fees for fire construction of fire station number four and did not apply that to the, uh, the, to the uh, uh, principle of paying down of that fire station. Uh, by the way, the fire district's attorney has a uh, complete detailed record of the impact fees that I have compiled. What he does with that, that's his business. Uh, but that's my comment. Thank you very much, sir. Any other speaker wish to speak at this time? Please come forward. Good morning, uh, John Spear, 25720 Creek Bend Drive, 30 year resident of Benita Springs and former member of the City Council. Uh, I speak today in support of uh, the proposal in 9B, uh, and uh, I, I would like to start by suggesting and pointing out uh, uh, Fred Forbes makes a great point. Uh, you know, you've got to be careful about this unless you've walked in somebody else's shoes. I've walked in your shoes for four years, and uh, uh, everything that's in this uh, green sheet is true. and demonstrably true. Um, nobody can criticize Martha for her commitment to service, for her commitment to her constituents, or for her passion. Uh, but passion cannot excuse bad conduct. And uh, 
nobody saw this more uh, closely than the, the five of you or the six of you who were here when I threw my iPad across the room in a moment of anger and passion. My passion did not excuse my conduct and you all know that you had a written apology the next morning in your in baskets. I felt horrible about that. Uh, some, some people that are not big fans of mine uh, uh, continue to take great uh, pleasure in, uh, in that uh, loss of control of mine, but uh, there you go. Uh, the charges are really broken into two pieces. Number one, the uh, conduct at meetings. It's on TV. Everybody sees what goes on here. Everybody can judge for themselves, but uh, those of us who have sat up there, you know, the endless questions, the endless dragging on of the meetings, the waste of staff time by having to sit here at the cost of probably five or six hundred bucks an hour while the meetings last a couple hours longer. I, I'm not sure that that alone justifies reprimand or, or censure, but we've left it on the mayor and the mayor alone to try to control the meeting. And uh, uh, Ben, you've tried your best, but it's just, uh, it's, it's just been impossible to really rein things in. The second part of this, though, is really the part you ought to be concerned about. And, uh, you know, the folks that have come here to support Martha probably don't know because they haven't heard the stories from the staff. They haven't heard about the interference with the code enforcement pro with process, about Martha inserting herself in the code enforcement process at the investigative level, encouraging code enforcement staff to pursue people that th she thinks need to be pursued and to lay off people she thinks to be, need to be laid off. They haven't heard the stories about the employee interference, the interference with HR, the uh, interference with the hiring process, the interference with the discipline process. Calling staff after hours and directing staff, not the city manager, but city staff to uh, kick groups of people out of the park. Uh, I got a call about that uh, and, I, and you know, Ben knows that happened. And most frighteningly of all, interference in law enforcement, inter interference and in things like that. Um, you all know the stories, you've heard the stories, whether you want to share those stories today or not, I don't know, that's up to you guys. Uh, I'm not up there anymore, so it's, uh, you guys are, can deal with this. But this has been going on for six years. Uh, we've, the staff has talked, uh, probably some of you have talked to the extent you've been able to, and it's time to do the right thing. What that right thing is, you guys can figure out, but uh, it's important that this, particularly this stuff uh, uh, in B, needs to be needs to stop because it's totally totally out of line thank you thank you sir anyone else this time like to speak please come forward good morning terry lamaine bonita springs for the record i am here today to ask the city council to please support our request of the bonita blues festivals annual festival coming up I would like to re um, seek your approval for not only the special event permitting, but the co-sponsorship of the event. I have been a very proud, dedicated member of the committee since 2006. We have put on a wonderful two-day event that not only showcases our beautiful city of Bonita Springs, but it gives back money to local charities. To date, we have given back over $55,000 to local charities. 100% of our net proceeds go back to the community and we are non-paying staff members. We are 100% volunteer driven. I would also like to give attention with your approval of the permitting that it also increases economic development within our community. We have a lot of people that come here from all over the country. They stay in our hotels. They eat in our local restaurants because a majority of them are here for two or three nights due to it being a two-day festival. So with that, I wanna thank you for your continued support with our request for a special event permit and the co-sponsorship, and we will make you proud March 8th and 9th to be here in Bonita Springs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, anyone else like to speak this time? Please come forward. Any agenda item? Seeing none, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, close the uh, public comment at this time and con uh, go to the consent agenda. Councilpersons, <coughs> my fellow members, uh, do you have anything on the uh, the list, let's see, we've got A through H that you would like to pull. I had some questions that were answered by staff, but I'd move to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councilwoman Martin. Aye. Councilman Slatko. Aye. Mayor Nelson. Aye. Councilman Simmons. Aye. Councilwoman Simons. Aye. Councilman Longcart. Aye. Councilman McIntosh. Aye. Okay, we are at item eight, public hearings. Audrey. 
Thank you. The first is to amend a resolution. It's resolution 12-20, which is the administrative code for the policy and procedures for processing land use extensions of development orders or building per, uh, permits when mandated by the state to eliminate the payment in certain circumstances when the legislative act prohibits charging for the processing. In April, City Council set up this process. It's a good process. Um, shortly thereafter, the legislature, in their divine wisdom, um, wrote up a, uh, a new law, House Bill 503, effective July 1, tw uh, 2012, that actually prohibits the city from making any charge. Um, a lot of cities are still charging. I don't recommend that action. Um, I recommend that if the person says that they're not to pay and it falls within those legislative that they're talking about, uh, not to pay. Now, there are some other legislative ones that you would pay the processing, such as emergency declarations, tr uh, Tropical Storm Debbie, I heard was going to be eight months, an extension. Uh, those you would pay require payment for processing. Okay. Council, you have any questions for Audrey? Any comments? No? So, Audrey, what's your, what's your, this is basically a, an affirmation of what, what the law is at this time. It, it is. It's just correcting the administrative code to incorporate that section 23 prohibition. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So I'll make that motion. We have a motion over here, uh, Councilwoman Simmons. And second. Uh, second by, uh, yes. Comment, public, public comment. Oh, okay. We have a motion and a second. At this time, we'll take public comment on this particular item. Anyone who wishes to speak on this matter, please come forward. Seeing none, uh, public comment is closed, and we have a motion and a second. Any other comment? Roll call. Councilman Slakta? Aye. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Councilman Simmons? Aye. Councilwoman Simons? Aye. Councilman Lockhart? No. Councilman McIntosh? Aye. Councilwoman Martin? Aye. Okay. Uh, what do you have next for us, Audrey? Thank you. Uh, the next is a second reading and public hearing of the following ordinance. This is an ordinance of the City of Bonita Springs approving the petition of Bonita Springs Utilities, Inc., modifying its wastewater tariff to approve a special service charge for the villages in Imperial Bonita Estates community, providing for an effective date. This is the second reading. Uh, this or um, ordinance is a request for a tariff change, a special service charge for IBE. I have reviewed the affidavit of publication. It is legally sufficient. Uh, Fred um, Parton can provide any input as to the petition, if you'd like to hear from Mr. Parton um, <coughs> at this time. I would also request that following this hearing that we proceed with City Attorney Item B so we can do BSU's items all at one time, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Good very morning. Good. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, most of you are aware of our background and history of, of bringing sewers to Benny Springs. Mr. Bachman and Mr. Fields pretty much laid out the background on the uh, Imperial States Lot Owners Association area. IBE, just for your information, is broke into two parts. You have the cooperative area where everybody belongs to the co-op, and then you have an, a section of it that the properties are owned individually, and they have an HOA. This is the area of the individual property owners. In 1993, they hooked up to our wastewater system. At that time, we were able to, uh, or they were able to eliminate their package, package plant from that community and able to recoup that property for use as storage and other uses uh, in that area. Uh, so we've been the wastewater provider since 1993. They've owned and operated their wastewater system since that time. You've got a nice detailed report. We went in, tele televised all the internal systems. We know what's there. It's in very poor condition, but we're equipped to handle these sorts of things much better than they are. You know, if you have something occur at three o'clock in the morning, we can be out there within an hour, whereas they've got to chase somebody down to try to, to respond. So we're well equipped. They're members of the utility, uh, longtime members, and we're here to serve them as well as the balance of the community. Uh, I think this is a good thing for them. I think this works fine for us, and we're happy that to come before you. And I do appreciate the HOA there uh, approaching us to take the system over, and I'm glad that we're able to, to work with them. I feel this is fair for everybody concerned. So. Be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, Council, any questions for uh, for uh, the representative from BSU? Fred, uh, did, did you had a series of, uh, or at least a couple of uh, uh, public uh, workshops out there for them or with the representatives for them? Actually, I had a couple of meetings. They approached me, I wanna say a year and a half, two years ago about the idea 
of uh, us taking over this system. Uh, they had had some problems in there. Uh, they had to have some repairs made. And again, for them to do it because they're not equipped to handle it, it it's very difficult. And uh, so they, they approached me. I agreed to take a look at it, see what we could do. Uh, we're not going to go in and rebuild the entire system like we are some areas that we've gone into. In this particular area, we're going to go ahead and take care of some of the you know, worst areas. We're going to eliminate the infiltration, uh, some of the worst things. But over time, um, we hope to do a lot of this internally in-house uh, repairs, do like slip lining, pipe bursting, things like that, that you can go into older areas and upgrade their infrastructure versus replacing the whole thing. So um, they approached us. Uh, we looked at it. We came up with this number. They felt good about it. We feel okay about it. So we think it's a win-win. Okay. Any other questions before I go to public comment? Yeah, Peter. I was just going to say, just a comment. Um, as you know, last meeting I voted against moving this forward. And since that time, you and I have spoken. And it goes back to what happened a few months ago, and we've also mm -hmm. spoken about that and look forward to speaking about it more. Mm -hmm. A few months back, we heard from all kinds of citizens from Bonita Springs, mm -hmm. and you know nobody wanted to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Fast forwarding to now, I have not heard from anybody from, Bene um, from the city on this issue, so I will be reversing my vote and voting in favor of this. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else this time before I go to public comment? Fred, thank you very much. Do you have anything else before we go to public comment? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I'll give you the opportunity. If there are any questions, you can come back up, okay? At this time, we'll open up public comment. Anyone wishing to speak it to this matter, please come forward. Seeing none, Council, what's your pleasure? I'll make the motion we approve. Second. The motion to approve is our second. I'll second. As second. a second by Councilwoman Martin. Um, any other comment? Roll call. All right, whatever. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Councilman Simmons? Aye. Councilwoman Simons? Aye. Councilman Longhart? Aye. Councilman McIntosh? Aye. Councilwoman Martin? Aye. Councilman Slecko? Aye. Okay, at, at this time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and forward item 9B, which is permission to advertise the following ordinance uh, in reference to uh, uh, new construction fee banking. Uh, Audrey. Thank you. And um, on this one, you'll notice it was signed by the city manager, Mr. Schwing. Uh, he wanted this to go forward, even though he was not going to be here today. On this, this is a proposed amendment to the franchise. And under this um, amendment, uh, when the city set up the franchise, affordable housing was a major issue. Now, um, affordable housing has taken lesser of an issue, and the issue is with ANCs. What this uh, system sets up is, uh, or section 14 of the ordinance, of the franchise ordinance, what that allows is for the ability for uh, when the city purchases property to have that um, the capacity that is on that property, both for impact fees along with ANC for water and sewer, it's ANC. I normally use impact fees because I think of roads and libraries and such, um, or parks. The we are able to bank it and then use it off-site for another property, and we have always transferred that use by resolution. Currently, we pay a capacity reservation charge. This way, you do not have to pay the capacity reservation charge. A capacity reservation charge would only allow on the same site to use it once we started building on it. Um, in this case, there's some mobility and being able to move it. So from an economic standpoint, uh, there are some great advantages to the city. Uh, if, if I'm just to interrupt, define who, or you said you, you mean the city. City, city council. The city, the city only, city owned properties. This does not apply to any other properties, correct? correct? Good, I correct. want to be sure this that's clear. This is only for city owned properties where the city would then be able to use it not just for affordable housing, but also for economic development projects. So if the city determines there is a valid and when I say the city, I mean city council, that there is a valid economic development project. Um, it would come back to city council, and city council would determine whether or not to use the monies that are available through these banked uh, ANCs, or aid to new construction, for that purpose. Uh, Lisa, can uh, Lisa from finance, Lisa Pace, can actually give you a better financial understanding she wrote or drafted portion of this green sheet dealing with the financial aspects if you have questions as to that this is a permission to advertise this would have public hearings we'd have a first reading on september 5th and a second reading on september 19th 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John, do you have anything else to add or any other stuff? There? No, other than to say that, uh, as Audrey indicated, this was kind of a, a combination effort through the city manager's office, finance, legal, and, and also our partners over at BSU to see if there was a way to craft a, a process that would be an advantage to the city in terms of economic development and not impact negatively BSU. Um, I'd support going forward with this. All right, good. Council, any questions? Uh, Steve? I have a comment. The, the our city manager, Carl Schwing, has worked very hard to make this happen. It, and to Councilman Grant's point, it, it, needs, it, it has the relationship, as, as the DRG, DRG, DRGR does, to transfer development rights. It allows us to move money into places where we couldn't have moved it before, but with specific definition. It's a, it's a boost to the economic development plan, and I would fully support it. Okay, good. Um, Bill. Um, <coughs> good morning, everybody. Um, what about the fees that we that have been collected from by the utility? Uh, it, it amounts to, I believe, 197. Am I on the right track on this? You're talking about the capacity reservation charge that was 30, paid. The thirty thousand dollars a year that we've been paying mm -hmm. BSU. I don't believe you're uh, that they are giving a refund, but they are setting it up so this will be uh, progressively going forward. Well, are we going to get the money? Is that what you're saying? Forward. I'm going forward, you will no longer pay this. Yeah, I, you will I no understand. longer put money to BSU. Instead, you, if you choose to bank property, because there may be times where you choose not to bank it, if you choose to bank the property and the monies uh, go into that ANC bank set up already by Section 14, you have the flexibility to use it for affordable housing, which you've always had the flexibility to do. Or alternatively, you could use it for economic development as defined by resolution by you uh, for specific property. And that's no different than if we gave money to Habitat for Humanity for impact fees or aid to new construction, we do it by resolution today. Uh, what about uh, Maywood property? The same thing is going to happen with yes, that sir. too? Okay. Uh, for the audience, uh, there's approximately uh, $240,000 that uh, the public utility has received. Uh, and this all came about uh, some time ago. Uh, I, uh, a constituent asked me to s find out why we were paying X number of dollars to BSU. And it wasn't me, it was some, a person, a concerned citizen in the city. And uh, of course, all this, I, I, I'm trying to understand why the 197,000, why it wouldn't come back to the city since they're willing it, it, in such a way. And I don't know where they put it because it's right. a private corporation, but. It, it concerns me that we'd be paying all that money, sure. 197000 and 40000 for the other property. If I could respond to that, sure. I, I believe that the answer is very similar to what you have with East Terry. You made a uh, short-term decision, and that short-term, and East Terry was the, uh, the traffic light. We, we rented a traffic light uh, temporarily because we were going to make improvements in the next year or two, and then those improvements were not necessary or they, they lowered on the totem pole. Same thing here. You pay a capacity reservation charge, and any property owner pays that capacity reservation charge. They're treating us the same as any other property owner in the city of Benita Springs or anybody else within the franchise area because the franchise is beyond the city of Benita Springs a capacity so they don't have to go in and pay the new construction costs over again so there's a benefit if you're only going to use it for a few years but if you take longer than a few years it is not cost um, appropriate you know and that's a decision because it was a short-term decision that wasn't looked at from a long term for both Mayhood and Bamboo, I think. Um, I'm not uh, convinced that uh, we should not be getting a rebate from Benita Springs Utilities uh, based on what I know. Uh, and I'm obviously uh, concerned about that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it was a constituent that brought it to my attention. And this is something that we all should be looking at in terms of looking at the total picture. And I have a different take on this but specifically I'm concerned with the city and what we pay and it's, it's my it's our responsibility to always look for those kind of things and uh, when I uncovered this I uh, you know I know we worked out a deal I understand that but uh, I'm not happy with the deal in terms of the large sums of money that could be put into the supposed EDC it would be about 240,000 which would be a very nice bump 
uh, to utilize in some other fashion. But uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Mr. Good. Uh, Fred, could you come forward for a minute and uh, and explain the uh, the ANC fee program? And sure. I mean, I, I think I have a pretty good idea. Once yeah. once someone builds something <laughs> and they give you an ANC fee, you use that money and, and build infrastructure with it. So it's hard to give it back, isn't it? I, exactly. I, I need to simplify the thought process on this. The affordable uh, housing credits that have accumulated over the years, that was negotiated when we did the uh, original franchise, as Audrey mentioned. That was something that was near and dear to everybody's heart, trying to get more affordable housing to the area. And because they were not paying the monthly capacity reservation fees, there was no guarantee for that capacity. If we had it available, okay. <clears throat> if we didn't, then you would not be able to recoup that until such time that we had excess capacity. So you were, there was a certain amount of risk with that. Then you had the other pot where you uh, had acquired some of the properties that had numerous units on it that had paid impact fees over the years. And there was a thought at that time that they would be used for other things. And you wanted, you chose to maintain those credits so that if you ever built on those properties, you could apply them to whatever the use may be or that you would choose to use on that. And that's what has been paid for the past X amount of years, however long that's been. But one of the things, um, Bill, to, to help you understand from our perspective, probably 70 to 75% of your costs of the utility are fixed costs, meaning that whether you use a drop of, of water or whether you use the sewer, the utility is going to incur those costs. The operation and maintenance of the facilities, the grounds, the staff. Uh, when you actually use, have consumption, then the chemicals come into play, electricity, and a lot of those big costs. So that's kind of the difference. So we were maintaining that capacity for you over, over time, and it was available to you. And now uh, you're taking a position that you, you don't necessarily need that guarantee, but in order to move it over into this other pool of credits, um, we need to redo the franchise and, and include economic development in that definition. You're going to be the ones that determine what applies, what you can use this for. That, that's your call. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be if capacity is available. Today it's not a problem. The next three to five years I don't see a problem. But beyond that there's, you know, no guarantees in the future. Well, thank you, Fred, for, for that. I, I, under I understand what you said, and I'm only – what happens if someone hadn't looked at that? I wonder if it would have still continued because I don't know if all the council people realized, and I don't know because you know, fog, uh, that, that that large sum of money every year was being done. And I only bring it to the fore because we need to make sure that we understand, especially up here, exactly what we're doing with other people's money. And, and I know fine. some people don't like to talk about dollars and cents, but the, the country needs openness so that we understand all those things and that's all i'm going to say about it thank okay. you thank you very much any other questions yes yes um council council i agree with you totally the the issue though is when and this is previous council and i'm not faulting them but they went into a contract and the contract was the city will continue to pay that in order to attract economic development it wasn't a great contract it didn't work out well and part of it was we were under some assumptions that simply didn't work uh, that council was but in, in fairness to what BSU is doing, they're giving up future, future revenue in order to support economic development in this, in this case. And we had a contract, didn't work, but I think uh, BSU is trying to work with the city and, and the EDC to make this thing come out right in the future. Okay. Well, well, can I just make one comment, Ben, please? Yes. Uh, the, the Benita Springs Utilities is going to have increased revenue ongoing for a long time to the benefit of the utility because of the when we come out of this recession they'll do very well because of their fee structure for all of us that are current users and I know that the income for the utility will be increasing so they sh will be able to provide all the service we have the best water in the, pl in, the in the country but their financials are going to be enhanced dramatically by the uh, change in the atmosphere in the country thank you we can only hope that we will all do better in the That's future. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, any other comment? Uh, would you like to move this forward, Council? So moved. We have motion to move it forward. Is there a second? Second. Have a motion and a second to go ahead and uh, move this forward. Um, any other comment? Roll call, please. Councilman Simmons. Aye. All right. Councilwoman Simons. Uh, no. Councilman Longhart. No. 
Councilman McIntosh? Aye. Councilwoman Martin? Aye. Councilman Selecta? Aye. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Okay, the motion carries. And uh, Audrey, you have any other questions regarding that? Or are you okay? No, that's it. Okay, uh, item C. Thank you. And this is a continuation of a second reading that was held on August 1st. Uh, this is an ordinance of the City of Benita Springs amending certain sections of the zoning ordinance, amending 4-377 public hearings, 4-381 duration of rights conferred by adopted master concept plan, amending the following use tables, 4-653, 4 694, 4-735, 4-791, and 4-934 amending 4-1297 to require a special exception for all keeping of alligators and other certain animals, um, amending Division 16, farm produce stands, you pick operations, roadside stands to permit farmer markets and community gardens by amending 4-1711 through 4-1715 relating to farm produce, creating 4-1716 farmers markets and 4-17 standards for community gardens, amending Division 17, fences, walls, gates, and gatehouses by amending sections 4 1741 through 4 1744, amending 4 2020 parking, amending section 4 2191 measurement permitted encroachments to permit open decks, amending 4 2194 related to setbacks from bodies of water, amending 4 3041 temporary uses, and creating 4 3105 to prohibit large metal buildings super sheds in residential districts providing for conflict severability codification inclusion and code scrivener's errors and an effective date uh council uh, since your continuation the ordinance was amended on the second page of the green sheet um, there's a summary and there's a more extensive summary provided by john dolmer uh, i pointed out that in the summary uh, the, the uses that were taken out for daycare facilities, health care facilities, model homes. And by taken out, it means uh, you're not going to allow it to be done administratively. It would be by special exception. Uh, and with City Council still having the possibility of looking at proposed changes to bed and breakfast, Lee County Sheriff's Office substations, post offices, produce stands, private on-site recreational facilities, and non-commercial schools. I also want to point out since our last meeting, I had a conversation with Department of Agriculture and Consumer Affairs, their general counsel. Um, I made some minor modifications to our agricultural components to respect Florida statute section 604-50, which exempts uh, from building permits or from local ordinances certain agricultural components. And I also made the change we're currently transmitting uh, to Department of Economic Opportunity, the um, comprehensive plan changes, and that the effective date, if applicable, for certain components of this will not go into effect until after the comp plan is changed. Okay. John, I, I imagine you have a presentation for us. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Only if it's necessary. <laughs> it's necessary. <laughs> I would believe. Am I not right, Council? To start off, let's go through. I know Audrey gave a brief synopsis, but the items that we agreed upon, because it's good to start off on a good note. Uh, things that we all thought were a good idea at the last hearing include uh, requiring applicants to provide an updated master concept plan if uh, this council approves a plan development with changes. So if you condition uh, an application at hearing, that applicant would then need to reflect that change and submit the plan to our department. Second item, 4-377B7, uh, simply provides a process for plan developments which are remanded to the zoning board. Uh, currently you have the option to remand a, a case to the zoning board, but there's no process for us to handle it if you do. Uh, probably better to accept a process prior to someone <coughs> going through it. Uh, you also thought the idea of community gardens was a good idea in the following zoning districts, agricultural, single family, multifamily, mobile home, RV, and plan development. Associated with that, you also uh, agreed with the definitions and development standards for community gardens. Fire station, forestry towers, produce stands, uh, those were items you thought should be administratively approved. And you also thought it was a good idea to require a special exception for the keeping, breeding, or display of alligators or venomous reptiles. 
these are the items, and the city attorney did a good job of outlining these that you did not want to discuss any further and you wanted to leave under the current uh, regulations. Uh, daycare, adult and child, health care facilities, group one and two, the county department of transportation maintenance facility, and a post office. These are the items we're going to go through today. Uh, there was discussion on how to uh, extend uh, plan development master concept plans. Uh, there were several uses that were being proposed to change approvals within the agricultural zoning districts. Uh, farmers markets, uh, changes to the regulations of uh, fences and, and residential project walls, setbacks from bodies of water, and what I'll call the shed ordinance, but we've referred to as metal buildings and residential zoning districts. Currently, for planned developments, once you have approved a project and the effective date comes and goes, that applicant has five years in which to either complete the project or to complete at least 20% of the site work. Uh, recently, we've seen a number of plan development applications which have not done either, mainly because those that own the property or plan to develop the property didn't see a market for it. So we've seen several requests for extensions. And in those requests, uh, what will happen is an applicant will file with our office, we will review the application, we'll advertise the hearing, we'll take it to the zoning board, we'll bring it to, to city council, and to date, City Council has approved all of these requests. Lee County has already started making some changes to increase the amount of time that a master concept plan is valid. And there's a pretty good reason for it because they don't tend to be controversial and the process as it currently stands tends to be lengthy for the type of approval you're getting. After proposing a modified version of this to the LPA, uh, what we have come to after their hearing and two of your hearings is the duration of a master concept plan will remain at five years. At the end of that five years or prior to that five years uh, coming and going, an applicant would be able to file with our office and we would be able to administratively extend that plan development uh, approval for a period of two more years. If they have not completed their development or if they have not completed 20% of the site work uh, within their property, they would then have to come to this city council to request an additional extension and that would be for another two years. There is no uh, ability for anyone to apply for a third extension. So currently as the regulations are proposed, you would not be able to have a master concept plan uh, valid for a period of more than nine years. Uh, the only real change to this would be if an applicant uh, was also applying for a development of regional impact. Those developments, as you know, they're reviewed not only locally, but by the Regional Planning Council and, and by the Department of Econo Op Op Economic Opportunity. And approvals for those developments include a build-out date. Now, we have never attached master concept plan uh, validity to the build-out date, but it does make a lot of sense. If the Regional Planning Council has reviewed it and, est and estimated that it will, a project will be built out in a certain year, the state of Florida has agreed on the same year and you, by essence of approving that development of regional impact, have agreed upon that same build-out year. Why would we not also attach the validity of a master concept plan to that date? It just seemed to make sense to us. So this kind of goes through what I just covered. Two extensions and DRIs would be tied to build-out dates. And one of the other weaknesses, this kind of goes along the lines of, of the remand procedure. Right now, in our land development code, there is not a process for master concept plans which have expired to be reinstated. Now, we have reinstated several of them. We've taken them through the hearing process, and council has, has blessed them, and they have become uh, valid master concept plans again. But it makes us feel more comfortable if there is a specified process in place so that uh, when an applicant comes in, maybe they purchase, it tends to be when someone has purchased property and it has come with a master concept plan that has expired maybe by one or two years and they want to reinstate that, that we can sit down with them and explain to them exactly what they need to do and exactly how they need to do it uh, and point to certain sections of our land development code as proof. Are there any questions on Okay. Um, concept plan before we change subjects. 
why don't why don't we take these one at a time instead of going through the whole thing and yes, then coming sir, back why. again? All right, and and let's start with the, if you can go back to the duration of rights for planned developments. <clears throat> and uh, council, do you have do you have any questions or comments concerning that? And as I as I understand it, to kind of paraphrase here, correct me if I'm wrong, is to keep it at five years, uh, the minimum of 20 percent, unless a minimum 20 percent is constructed. If they come in for, if the applicant wants to extend that for two years, you, uh, you're making a proposal that it be done administratively according to the rules that apply at that time. Yes, sir. And that if they want to, and then after that, after that two years, which would be a seven-year period, they can come to city council after they come through and check with you first. The application goes to you, then to city council, and city council would approve the next two years. That is exactly right. And after that, if they haven't done 20 percent, that's done. They have to come back in for a new approval. They got to come for a new approval. And, and just to provide a little bit of information, uh, the requirements for submittal remain identical. We're not changing what you need to submit for an extension uh, for the administrative review. So it would be the same as it currently is. Um, and when an applicant comes before city council for an extension, you would also have the right to review that application to make sure uses, uh, intensities, and densities are still appropriate for that site. Okay, and before, before we go to comment, explain the time period is not consistent with DRI build out dates? Yes, sir. Wh which time period? When the city council approves master concept plan or plan development, an associated master concept plan, that is valid for a period of five years before right. it expires. A typical DRI could be 15 to 20 years. So there is, there is a significant gap between what the city has uh, looked at for a valid master concept plan and when the state of Florida has assumed that project will be built out. What we would like to do is tie the plan development approval with that build out date associated with the DRI. And if there are any changes that would be uh, made to the DRI build out date, the master concept plan uh, date would change along with it so that okay. those two are identical. Okay, uh, would it be all right if we, uh, council and staff, would it be all right if we consider non DRI projects first? That would probably that be a very process? good idea. Yes, sir. And then we can talk about the other. Council, uh, Bill, I believe you had a question or comment. <coughs> well, <coughs> I just one, and it's on 4381. Um, I have a, a difficult time with after five years, administratively, you can do what you want to do uh, without bringing it back to the council at that time. Because most of, by that time, most people will not, will, some of us will be here and some of us won't. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I just don't think it's fair to the to the council people that are coming on. I think it should come back to the council after five years, period, and make sure every council has an opportunity to review the decision that you might make. And uh, uh, I, I'm firm on that, and I'm not going to change my uh, opinion on it because I think that that's the best way to do it. Uh, five years is one thing, but two years administratively, not for me. So uh, what you're suggesting is that it remain the way it is right right now, which is five years and then the, every extension. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It comes no. back to council. We're Currently, to council. I believe there is some administrative extension. Uh, there isn't? Okay. Well, it's good that you both agree. Yes, sir. That you don't. <laughs> It, uh, how, how, is it, as, how is it being interpreted? Currently, when, when an applicant comes in to an extended master concept plan, they are sent through the public hearing process. And that's the way we have handled it. That's the way that those applications have been processed, and those are what you have seen right. uh, when okay. they've been presented to you. So, that, Councilman Longcroft, that's your suggestion that it remain the way it is right now. You come uh, back to Council. Council, do you, have, do you have any other comments regarding that or any I opinions? Do. I do. Yes. Councilman, yeah. Councilman Simon. Thank you. Um, I concur, and concur with Bill, but let me ask you, is there a change here? You said um, five years and then administrative approval, and then they'll come back in two years after that, if I'm incorrect about that, but that that would be a date in which, at the seven-year point, I guess, that um, uh, certain items could be reviewed and changed. What, uh, that is not currently the issue at this time. So I would take a blended approach to this, and that would be, um, no offense to staff, but I really like to keep things in the public so the public knows, you know, what's going on with their community. And he, uh, Councilman Larkart, Lonkart made a good point because as we change councils, uh, whatever the feeling of 
people people is that what's decided before could be subject to change and um, I also like to keep things in the public so people know what's going on in their neighborhood and and can keep up to date so I'd like to see maybe a blended approach where um, I don't want to see giving away the authority of council because it starts to weaken this body and the representative government we have so I'd like to keep it to bring it to council but being able to do what you said we could do at the seven-year review at the five. Do you understand that, Mr. Lunkert? I got it. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I do not, however. Um, so you're, you're saying that we do, uh, at five years, you want to go ahead and bring it back to council? Right. Right? And then after, and that extends for a two-year period? No, sir. Okay. Go ahead. So that we don't have to have the two-year period. Is that correct? All development plans would be for seven years instead of five years? Well, you could do it that way, too. So instead of coming back at five, you come back oh, at seven oh, right. and just, yes. No, I was just to say, so w when we're looking at the, the validity of a master concept plan, are you saying that, that this should be valid for five or seven years? Well, what I'm saying is that if it, it could come back at five. Okay. Okay. And at that time, do the review that you would do at seven. I mean, to me, having two-year window there can be somewhat um, uh, uh, create sort of an indecision. Did you not say, yeah? Well, it, it, okay. as a matter of fact, they're both the same review, right? The, the one you would do at two years and one you would do at down seven or at nine, they, nine years would be they, the same or whatever. They are the same review. However, the council under the proposal would have the authority to review uh, residential densities, commercial intensities, and the schedule of uses. So there could be amendments made to it as part of the extension request. If Council Member Simons, uh, if I understand her correctly, right. what she's saying is there would not be an administrative extension, but the time periods proposed, which are currently in place now, right. the five-year validity, uh -huh. a two-year extension, and the possibility of a second two-year extension would remain in effect, but all approvals would go through the City Council. That would be correct. And, you know, um, we have a record here of being very friendly and approving. I mean, I, I haven't seen us not approve. So I don't think that's going to be a problem there. But it does help us as we, c we continue to uh, evolve in what standards we're raising for this community to help those coming out of the ground to come to standards. So, uh, and as the council changes. So, uh, you agree with Bill? And I, sort I of it's a little different and, and I don't I've never seen this council uh, provide additional issues or, or anything unexpected to any applicant that's asked for an, an extension of their master concept plan the purpose behind this request was not because we want to handle these ourselves it was mainly to be more in line and competitive with what surrounding jurisdictions were doing in terms of review it, it, I don't think there there is an opinion amongst the development community that this, the city council has ever caused uh, problems or delays when they're, they haven't been necessary. But I, th I think when you tell someone, we can approve an extension administratively and it'll take you about three weeks, or we can send you through the public hearing process, which is gonna take you four to five months, they tend to be more comfortable with the administrative process. So it, I, I don't, from a time perspective, Bizarre. it seems. <laughs> <You know>. uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So Sorry. That was the purpose behind the request. But yeah, I, we, I do understand the, the intent of bringing it back to the council. And I. Okay. May um, I, let, I? Yes. Um, let's find some more people to the party here. Go ahead. <laughs> the, uh, the, the point made at that end of the dais is, is correct. And we have had an instance since I've been on council where, we had, where there was a developer who came forward asking for an extension. And there had been some unintended consequences on waters. Uh, and we had the opportunity then to put it out in front of the public. The public commented on the issue. The issue was resolved when we ex extended it. That, so I would agree that we probably need to have more public hearing. In other words, you would agree that we would keep, it, keep the system the same as it is now? Yes. Okay. In, any other comment? I, I don't need to pile on here. I feel we need to keep it open, public. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know. Like I said, there is no I in team. It, we are a team here, but there's would be a chance for citizen input and discussion. So, all in favor. Okay, and uh, so it, at this time, uh, there's I think I'm sensing a consensus here that it remained the same mm -hmm. as it was. Uh, now, yes. Just so I understand, remain the same means take out the administrative extension. 
Yes. Well, it doesn't, the, the administrative extension doesn't accept. We want to keep the, it the same as it is presently, so not as it right. presently is language. in the proposed right. document. Mm -hmm. Not as proposed as it is. Okay. Is that correct? Uh, that was not correct. Uh, is that correct? That's not correct. <laughs> That's not what I understood. As I understand. Okay. Oh, well, let me hear what John understands. Yeah. John, okay. explain. Well, I had heard Councilman Persimon state that there, there was some language that was in our proposal that would allow City Council to review uh, density, intensity, and the schedule of uses as part of your extension request. Other than at, that, at seven years. Yes, sir. It, it, well, it sounded like at, bo at, at the five years and at the seven years. At the five years and the seven. So that would be included in, in both extension hearings. You know, and presently that isn't that isn't within it. Right. It's it's rather gray. This would be more specific. So, so you want to be able, the council to be able to, and for staff to use as part of their guidelines to use density, intensity, that type of stuff. Yes, sir. This would be something Include that, that language. It's gray as whether we have the authority to bring before you under the changes in the text that's presented, it is much more clear. So if the uh -huh. council wishes, we can include that portion of the text and remain uh, consistent with what's there for the five-year initial period of validity and two two-year extensions, which would be approved by the city council. Mayor, may I ask? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, my understanding wasn't so much about intensity and density as much as um, uh, community standards for landscape design, lighting, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the more cultural aspect, if you speak, the architectural aspect of, of the community that's being created. And um, I don't know if there's a compromise here. Do you need to have a five and seven year approval? Could it be a five year and nine? So that it comes back at the five and then it comes back at the nine. So that seems to follow um, or four and four or six and 10 or something like that, you know, that you eliminate one of those approvals because when you're coming here at five years then you gotta come back in two more, it seems to me that that is a burden. And, and causes um, some insecurity in the process. We can have master concept plans valid for as long as this council would like. We can set it up so they never expire. Originally, uh, one of the drafts that was presented and was taken out by council was where we distinguished the size of the development. So if you had a small master concept plan um, that had the five years and then we had a larger one, something that had more community impact would be, I believe, seven years. Uh, but council asked that that be removed. Okay. Uh, council, just to, to chime in here, uh, I agree with Councilwoman Simons that uh, I, I think that doing, doing the density and intensity at seven years, I think that's, that's just way too soon. I mean, once you've approved something like that, I think it's way too soon to consider those type of criteria. At, the, at nine years, fine. I think that, you know, that nine to ten year period, things may have sufficiently changed to where you need to look at that. Uh, so either way, Council, if you want to do a stepped, a tiered approach, like I, I believe that Councilman Simons is, is proposing, which is to do, uh, to do uh, five and then nine, or to do five and seven, to come into Council. Um, it, e either way, as long as that density intensity isn't considered until that nine-year period. And, right? and Mayor, I think that's wise. It, but at the five-year, to be able to look at the, the standards uh, for architecture, well, that we, we don't change those a lot. We, we're trying to create a standard, but is, can that be well. considered at the time? I don't want to give you a specific example, but there's stuff that was approved way back when that does not comport with today's standards. And so what we see coming out of the ground today, we've made decisions about what we want to see in our city that's different than happened 10 years ago. And these are not things that I would say are hugely expensive, like changing density and intensity but that are things that would help uh, improve the character of our city, and we've decided that that's what we want. Right, so and explain what you would consider under well, this proposal. Right, right now, the language as it's currently written states, prior to granting any extension, city council will review uses for compatibility with existing and approved development, and may remove uses or add conditions to make the use consistent with the Bonita plan. City council may approve, deny, or limit the requested extension to a period less than the applicant's request. The decision of the City Council is discretionary. A master concept plan that has not received a development order and diligently pursued construction prior to the master concept plan extension expiration may not receive a second extension, but may be reviewed in accordance with Section 4-373. 
which is basically a but yeah. staff when staff starts to look at the master concept or w wants to go ahead and look at the master concept plan what criteria do you look and get in doing the extension mm -hmm. i mean do you look at these individual things like buffering and that Parking. type of thing do you look at that all over again audrey would you like to chime yes, in here i just want to chime it? in that there's a difference between a master concept plan and a development order right and the development order is where you're going to find the lighting standards the uh, the changes in lighting standards where you're going to find the buffering. Uh, the development order is where uh, it's going to be the um, the latest and greatest standards. I mean, you're not going to have an MCP go for an extension if there's a development order already issued. I mean, generally, that's not going to I mean, right. happen. Right. Important point. So what we're talking about here is, is a planned development, right? Mm-hmm. And, but once they come in for a development order and they start construction, it's still going to have, they're still going to have to come through for the renewal. It would be current code. Now, the only thing is if they have a deviation, like let's say a buffer deviation, uh, they would still have the right to have that buffer deviation. That's what was provided in their zoning ordinance where they got the deviation. What, what, what I think the concern is a lot of the standards that we include in development orders are in Chapter 3 of your land development code a lot of all of your zoning is included in chapter four if someone is applying for a development order unless there is a specific condition deviation or approval that allows them to do or requires them to do something specific we infer, enforce the current regulations for those sections as they are at the time the application comes in the door yeah. now there are exceptions if like i said for deviations or if there is a condition that maybe at the time of approval was more stringent than your land development code but as time has gone on, the land development code has become more stringent, so they are, have a lesser standard. It does happen. Uh, but when someone files a development order, unless there is something that tells us to review otherwise, we review under the current sections of Chapter 3. Okay. Really? Uh, May? Yes? So let me understand this, just to clarify really quickly. Somebody comes in, there's a zoning case, right? Mm -hmm. It's approved. It's approved at the standards of, say, 2005. City Council passes different standards uh, in 2006 or 10 or whatever, okay? They come back in for their master concept plan approval, and we can look at density intensity, but we can't touch what was approved in 2005 as far as uh, the, the more kind of, I'm going to call it cultural standards, not the bare bones density intensity, but all those other things that, um, uh, you would require in a development order. So when they come in for their development order, they have to do what we approved in 2005. No. Okay, because I'd like to see how can we marry that to this process. I think you have the opposite um, of what we're saying. What we're saying is if somebody gets their zoning in 2005, mm -hmm. uh, they get their master concept plan approved as part of their zoning uh, because this is planned development, not a conventional zoning. Uh, they go in, uh, 2010 occurs, and they need the extension, um, or they're going in for their development order. We, we can skip the extension part <coughs> first. Okay. Staff reviews it under whatever changes you have made to Chapter 3, so lighting, uh, any okay. changes. That goes up. If you, um, There's been times at zoning hearings where I've told council, do not put in certain conditions because you may have development standards that are more stringent and you do not want staff to be forced to a lesser stringent Very condition. Good. Now, if they have something in the zoning ordinance that specifies buffers shall be this or lighting shall be this, they cannot follow the new code. They have to follow what was in the zoning ordinance because that's more specific to that property. And that could either be because somebody did a relief or it could be because council insisted that we wanted certain sound elements, we wanted certain lighting elements in there for, for extra security. And, and just as, a, as an example, Village Walk. The earlier phases of Village Walk have one lighting style. I know. The later phases have a different lighting style. So as they've gone through and the code has evolved in Chapter 3, we have evolved their approvals. So. Uh, as you change your regulations, we enforce those regulations on development orders that, that come through the door. And you would do that even if it was administratively, you would do that? Right. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They have no choice. Yeah. That's the code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Code. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Council, d in, any other questions or comments? Yes. So, One more time. five years, 
we review we we all the stuff that uh, is of concern uh, standards that's done already so that's good so at five years we could look at uses and at nine years we can look at density uh, and have them come before council at both those times that is a policy decision those are about sure well options. that's what we're doing here so you're you're making a suggestion that we do two one at five years and one at nine instead of five and, and one seven. at nine and yeah and Yeah, and, and that way you're not creating uncertainty for whoever that person is. Five years, look at the uses. Are those appropriate for what's grown around the community? And nine years, look at the density intensity, if that's something that's uh, also appropriate at that time. But both and times come to council. council. Both times to council. Both times to council. That way you cut out some of the expense at seven. And, do you, you, know. do you want to make a motion to that? Effect? I would make a motion to that effect, Mr. Mayor. There's a motion to that effect. Second. Does everyone, yeah, there's a second. Mm -hmm. Does everyone understand the motion? Sure. You guys, do you guys understand it? Uh, the only thing I'm having some confusion on is staff would always be reviewing for consistency with the comprehensive plan. So when it provided its review at the four year, it would look at density and intensity, you know, for council's consideration at their hearing in year five for the four year extension. Because the language says for it has to. normally plan. that's what you know, you don't apply part of a comp plan and not apply the other part. It seems true enough. I'm having problems with that. Okay, so I guess basically what we're saying is five review and both at five and four. A five and four. Do a five, five and nine. Year, then a four yeah. year, and right. then another two year permissible. And you're not married to four years. You can go lesser than four years. That's the maximum you would be able to. Yeah. You, you, when the time comes to extend it, if there's a particular problem that you're worried about, you could just say, "Look, we're going to extend it." There's no guarantee of right to an extension of four years. You can extend it for a day. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, then, Mr. Mayor, if it's four years, then we should just do four, and they come back every four and just have one instead of five and nine uh, and just keep it simple so that people don't have to f try to calculate and figure this stuff out. Four, and then come back in four, and then come back in four. No, no yet they're nine done. Years. At nine years, they're done. Okay. Nine years right, are fine. done. So, so five, four, and then another four. Five? No. No, no, no five and four is five nine. Four. Right? Right. <laughs> I want to make sure. Wait a minute. Let me get my calculator up. So it, they'll they'll be under review then for uses and density at five and nine years. At five and yeah. Nine. Yeah. nine to city council. So I would amend my motion to be that to do to do, uh, to do five and four. They both come back to council. It's as simple as that. Okay. As I understand, five years is when you approve it the first time at zoning hearing. Then and. After the five years, they want an extension. That would be the four that they could ask for. So that comes up to nine. Do you then allow one more time, or is that done? No, I mean, I think, I think the way it is now, that you after nine years right now, they're Correct. done. That's staff's recommendation. Yes. But I kept hearing five at, at year five and then year four. There is no more four. Now, that was your confusion, not ours. Four. Okay. <laughs> that no belongs review. to you. Okay. That so there is no a review at nine. You're no. done. Yeah, you're they're, done. They're dead. They're dead. You have a review. You have a excuse me. You have a review at the end of five years. After, okay, and then at the end, you know, I mean, that's it. The, the, the amount of the period, the master okay. concept plan would remain valid is the same under your proposal as it currently is. It is no. the extensions are timed differently where there's only one, and it is a period of four years. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I guess I misunderstood because, okay, thank you. Uh, at f we were talking about a five and seven. They're coming in for review at five and they're coming in for a review at seven? No. No, ma'am. Okay, then I did misunderstand okay. that. <laughs> the, the initial period of validity is five years. That no change. We work under the same. And operation. at the end of five years, they would come back. They would come back in, and the extension that this council could extend would be four years. Uh, but what was okay and the confusion comes is that at the end of five years we would extend it for two years and then oh, I'm just saying the first proposal and at the end of two years we could extend it for another two that's what was proposed the shortcut to that was to go ahead and at the end of five years extend yeah. it for four years yes sir and just skip that other process right yes, but at the end of four years you're done then then you got to go through the whole process all over again is everybody Good. okay with that got it that's indicative of the motion yes sir all right. I, I will. It was not what the motion was. I will withdraw my motion and restate that motion because I'm understood we're having a review at nine. 
Okay, so to have a, a count, city count, I could ba basically what I'm doing is I'm removing a review and, and creating an extent and asking you to create a four year inst extension instead of a two year, right? Ta da! Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be, I'll withdraw my former motion and make that motion, Mayor. Thank you for your help. You're quite welcome. We have a motion, and uh, is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any other discussion? I thought not. Uh, <laughs> roll call, please. Councilwoman Simons? Aye. Councilman Longcart? Aye. Councilman McIntosh? Aye. Councilwoman Martin? Aye. Councilman Slackton? Aye. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Councilman Simmons? Aye. Okay, as it applies to DRIs, explain what you were requesting there. We. Yeah, I know. I'm almost nervous to bring up the old timeline again. <laughs> if under the current approval, um, which which doesn't exist anymore, which doesn't exist anymore, or won't oh. exist in 30 days, there you, go. you would have a period of uh, five years before your master concept plan was expired. A development of regional impact, uh, as part of their approval, establishes a build out date. Now, because these projects are larger and because they include multiple phases, generally they take longer than five years to develop. As a result, as opposed to having a strict five-year validity for a master concept plan on a DRI, we're proposing that we marry that build-out date and the expiration date so that when you look at a DRI and it has a build-out date, the Regional Planning Council looks at it, the state looks at it, everybody approves a build-out date and then you are approving a master concept plan associated with that development of regional impact, those two dates would be identical. So you don't have to worry about one expiring while the other one is valid. And if there are, would be any changes made to that build out date, the master concept plan validity would still adjust accordingly. So if that build out date was moved up or moved back, the validity of that master concept plan would be the same. Okay. Does that make sense? It's For, just to yeah. try to keep things simple. Right, hmm. right. And so the, the, so the consequences, I mean, but so far as the city of Benita Springs, the chances of us having any new DRIs that come within the city of Benita Springs, unless we do some pretty aggressive annexing, not, not a whole lot of land left out there, right? We got a couple. It, it would be rather We small. got a couple. And you may see older DRIs come back in to, <laughs> to ask for this, but. Are you? <laughs> All right. Um, and, and so, you know, I, again, to, just to try to muddy the waters, I mean, clarify this a little bit more, uh, is that the change would be all the smaller things. We've already decided that when it comes to the DRIs, you want to go ahead and for the, for the sake, quite frankly, of the, the developer and the DRI, they've gotten that permission. It takes a long time to do these developments. Uh, so you, you can't expect them to keep continually coming back in, coming back in, coming back in, because they've already got things started and underway, basically, in a lot of times. And, and how would it be to come back in, look, we're halfway through this, and now you want to change it, right? Yes, sir. Is that basically your rationale? You summed it up perfectly. Okay. Uh, council, any questions about that? Are you okay with the idea of uh, these DRIs, with, with making it consistent with the length of the DRI? Mm -hmm. I just consider that, Mayor, if I may, that um, we, we consider that, yes, but that uh, we just continue to hold the public hearings and keep it, you know, whatever it needs to be in the public with the process public. There, there wouldn't, if, if they develop within the period of their build-out date, there wouldn't be an extension and there wouldn't be a public hearing. Very good. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, so everyone's okay with that? Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and, and include that in, in the proposal in this second reading, okay? No, not from what's written. What do you got for us next? Uh, reinstatement of vacated master concept plans. Okay. And this basically occurs when somebody does not follow your instructions and extend the approval and their master concept plan expires. There is currently no process that allows them to reinstate it, even if they've file a day after the expiration. This proposed language would at least provide a process for them to reinstate a plan that has expired. Um, okay, right now the, the, plan, the, the process to reinstate it is to start all over again. Yes, sir, that's exactly right. Okay, so even now this would, this proposal that you have would even apply to one that has been through this. Let's say they've nine years or nine years is up, they could come back in if, if 
and have this reinstated under this process that you're proposing. Is that true? Yes, sir. What it's got to be within the nine years. In other words, somebody has to have waited five years and three days, and they're like, oh, we messed up. Can you yes, reinstate sir. it? And it always happens within a month <laughs> is when we always get the phone calls. It expired about a month ago, expired six okay. months ago. So this does not include one that goes past that nine years? No, sir. You're done after nine years. All right? Council, you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. So just within there, if they mess up and they miss their <clears throat> five-year date, this allows some process to go ahead and get them reinstated. Yes, sir. All right. And, and that process would be similar to, excuse me, Martha, but this process would be similar to the process that they would normally go through. Yes, sir. Through city council, right? Yes, Okay. Sir. Questions, council? Yes. Yes. Well, it just concerns me. Um, I'm not quite sure what the answer is here because on the one hand, we want to be able to, if people are having an economic difficulty getting something done, um, we want to be able to help them do that. On the other hand, I don't want to see people who kind of like game the system about it. So I don't know what the answer is to that. And, and you know, most people are doing the best they can with what they got. So um, my experience with these situations generally involves two distinct scenarios. The first is someone that originally entitled the property still owns the property and missed the date. And usually we get the phone call a month to six months after it's expired. I didn't realize it was expiring. I forgot, help me through the process. The other situation involves uh, someone purchasing a property where the master concept plan has already expired. And in those cases, they had nothing to do with the original entitlement. They had nothing to do with, with missing uh, required dates. They simply have property and they need to reinstate the master concept plan in order to begin construction. Now, there could be other examples, but in my experience, those are the two that tend to be the majority of cases. Okay. Mayor. Okay. Yes. How does this work in cases then where something is half built and they really don't have an intention to go much farther or, or let's say that because they don't have the capability, they've dropped the project and the thing's just sitting there half done. How do we assist in assist the neighborhood with having to deal with something like if, that. If you remember correctly, when we were looking at, at the time period, the time period, uh, the clock only runs until a project is built or until 20% of the site is constructed according to the development order. So if you have constructed, for the sake of argument, 21% of your site, mm -hmm. there is no more time clock. You, are, you have uh, the ability to develop over time as long as your permits remain active. Thank you. Yeah, so, Council, essentially, this, this won't affect anything after nine years. You've got to do over. This, just, this is just giving relief to people who've forgotten that five year, now have forgotten that five year period. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. And, you, and the community really doesn't lose anything from that because they've got to go through the process anyway. Yes, sir. It still is comes correct? before you. I think that this is a good thing. But, Council, what do you think? Yep. Okay. Good head nod? Good. Carry on. That is all we have for. Plan development approvals. Okay. Now we can talk about agriculture. Oh, before we go ahead, um, there was, I had a tough time reading the slides last time. So before we go through, currently. Yeah, I know they're so small. Yeah. Well, that, they're not this time. <laughs> <laughs> currently, um, there was a question as to what the entitlements were and what the process was for these uses. A bed and breakfast currently requires a special exception in the AG1 and AG2 district. It is not permitted in the AG3 district. A police and sheriff substation is permitted only if it's there already. So a new police or sheriff substation would not be permitted. A post office is only permitted if it's already there. A private on-site recreation facility is existing only, or if you want a new facility, it's a special exception. And a non-commercial school is existing only. So no charter schools or private schools could be built. Okay. To the first item, bed and breakfast. I know there was some, some talk about how this could fit into the, the uh, San Carlos Estates, Tropic Acres neighborhood. First of all, why you would want to do it. Secondly, if you had it, how would it function? And so I found a couple of pictures of uh, bed and breakfast. Um, these tend to be in a mix of neighborhoods. Um, this facility in Venice, I know, is located about four blocks south of 
the main street. Uh, Mount Dora, a little bit different of a city, more antiquing, uh, similar house on the left-hand side. Wilton Manors is um, a much more residential neighborhood on the East Coast. And uh, if my map is correct, this bed and breakfast is located in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So in terms of the ability for a bed and breakfast to be compatible and consistent with uh, the neighborhoods there, it is possible. And when we were looking through uh, the list of, of uses for the agricultural zoning districts after our workshop with the, with the residents of San Carlos Estates and Tropic Acres, the intent was what changes can we make uh, to leave them alone, which was the general consensus of what we heard. So when you see a mix of uses up there and wonder what the connection is, that's the connection. If we reviewed and looked at, at a use and felt that it could be done in a way that uh, if we reviewed it, made sure it was compatible, could fit into that neighborhood. And bed and breakfast was one of those uses. Was there any concern could, about could that? Well, how about the, 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 you're suggesting this done by special exception or be done administrative administrative approval. So they would still file an application with our office, right. and we would still review it prior to any building permits or... And right now, it's, it's, not, it's not an allowed use at all. Is that correct? It is a special exception. It is allowed by special exception now, so they can do this out there by special exception now. What you're proposing is to do it administratively. Yes, sir. Just getting clarification. Comments? Uh, to, to John's comment about why would they do it there, it's because it's beautiful, San Carlos Estate. Mm -hmm. so oh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. The, I would prefer to keep it at a special exception rather than administratively. Uh, I have spoken with a number of the neighbors out there, but at the same time, I, if it's something like bringing commercial into a residential district, even though it's allowed, uh, I, I'd like to have a public comment. Sir. Mm -hmm. okay. May I ask one other question? Yes, sir. You, you made a point about schools, non-commercial and charter schools, and you said they're not allowed. They're not allowed unless they're permitted by if they're already there, existing only. Okay. And if we want to create a charter school out there, how do we do that? Right now you can't. Okay. So we need to discuss that at some point. Yes, sir. It, it, when we get to that, there is there is a distinction between Lee County schools and private schools or charter schools. We I recognize get to it when that. that comes up. Okay. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, pick these off one by one here. So bed and breakfast, are you all satisfied to do this by special mm -hmm. exception? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Next. And next we're going to talk about police and sheriff substation. And one more time, round block just real quickly. Police and sheriff substation is currently currently only allowed if it is existing, meaning the site was constructed prior to the change in the zoning ordinance. There are no police or sheriff substations in the facility now, which means under your current regulations, there will not be a police or sheriff substation. So there. they're not allowed out there under in no, no conditions. That is exactly right. right. And so your proposal would be to? To allow them through administrative approval. Through administrative approval. Council, what, what's your feeling on that? Are you content to leave it as it is, which is a prohibited use, or would you like to let, allow it by special exception only, or by administrative approval? Special Councilwoman exception. Simons. Uh, Special exception. By special exception? Bill? No, no, what we could yes. use. Yeah. Yep, just in case. That way it doesn't preclude it if it seems necessary. Makes sense. Is that yeah. okay? Yep, yeah, makes sense. Let's allow by special exception. All right, post office. D Council, do you feel the same way about that? Sure. By special exception? They're not going to be building anymore. Yeah, that building well, anymore. Well, I, so I, I don't think this could, yeah, <laughs> I think it's slim to none, right? I, I had wanted to, um, I, there was mixed <laughs> feelings in this, and I have spoken with people before, and some people thought it was not to be discussed again, others thought it was. And I wanted to at least provide a little bit more information, so I made the mistake of calling the post office to ask for what they look for in a new site, which oh, I'm sure has me on a list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they also provided no information. So I cannot tell you what the post service looks for in a new site, uh, other than the fact I don't think they're building any right now. Yeah, uh, this may be a uh, kind of a solution looking for a problem, right? Could be, but it's 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 uh, like the the sh substation issue. I don't see anybody asking for it right now, but I don't know what's going to happen around or in that neighborhood five, ten years from now. And if if it's a use that could fit in, could be compatible. Council, do you want a lot by special exception, or do you just want to leave it pro a prohibited use? May I ask a question? Yes, go right ahead. Post office. If you say post office, does that also mean private post office? Because we have an indicate. Yeah, there's like, oh. you know what I'm saying? So we should be careful because that might allow a commercial use of these pickup stations or whatever. If we specify United States Parcel Service. Post office. United post States office. Post office. 
Yeah, I don't think they're coming along either, but what the heck, you never know. Yeah, yeah. yes, Janet. I don't know, something about that, I just think of the large trucks that come and go from the post office to pick up the mail on those residential streets, which are kind of residential, there are people living there. And I'm just not so sure about those unintended consequences of, yes, it would be convenient to have a post office possibly in the future, we never know, but I'm not so sure about the increased traffic that might come with it. And that's the beauty of the special exception process. Yeah, exactly. Because if they build a facility like is next to us here, that's much more intense than some of the other smaller post offices, which... Right. Yeah, if they want to do a Chukaluski type little post office thing right there, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it may be. The, the, and as a matter of fact, the community may come there to ask them to do that, and they may ask them to do that. And if it's prohibited, it's, <laughs> it's prohibited. But if you lot by special exception, at least it has to come here, and you, the council gets to weigh all of the stuff. Is would would that there? be all right, council? Sounds good. Yep. Okay, no. let's put it there. All right, next, uh, private on-site recreation. And I, I outlined this a little bit the last hearing, but... Um, I probably need to make the point a little bit more clear. If for some reason the residents of Tropic Acres or San Carlos Estates, which is the only area we are discussing, this change would apply, were to form an association. And after forming that association, decide we wouldn't mind having tennis courts or we wouldn't mind having a swimming pool and a clubhouse. Right now, that you would be requiring them uh, to go through a, a special exception for approval. And uh, the, the application that IBE brought forward several months ago now was for a recreation building. And that approval took approximately six to seven months before they found a definitive answer. It was not a controversial issue. Uh, it only impacted residents of that neighborhood which is why we're talking about on-site recreation. We're not talking about anything that exists off of property, not controlled by an association or a group that wants to build a site. And if one of these neighborhoods wants a pool, wants a tennis court, bocce court, clubhouse, um, should they be required to go through the public hearing process when the only impact is internal and not external? And that was the purpose behind the proposal. Okay. Council, you understand that? Uh, what's, your, what's your feelings on this? Mm -hmm. Any feelings? Mm, may I? Go, go right ahead. I know, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Oh, go right so ahead. So this means that somebody can't purchase a lot and say, I'm putting in a swimming pool and, you know, it'll be a private pool and we'll charge people from the neighborhoods. It has to be from inside a community plan development or uh, a homeowners association has to come forward and say, we want to do it in this limited area. It cannot happen on a street that doesn't have a homeowners association? There would have to be a controlling entity. So I won't say homeowners association, but that is a common. There uh, has to be a controlling entity that, that is a group entity other were, than just a property owner? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. So so under, under that kind of scenario, uh, I don't know, five or six people get together and f form their own little group association and say, we want to put in... Uh, five tennis courts and a swimming pool here that we can all use together, they can make an application. Yes, sir. They can make an application and or whatever. So in, in that particular situation, the, 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 the effects wouldn't be just internal because they would be making an application to put five lots together to do their own thing and there would be adjacent property owners involved, correct? That could be the case. However, there, uh, under, under your review criteria, you do look at off-site impacts for these applications. Now, whether we handle it administratively or whether it comes before this council, the criteria is still there. Yeah. Uh, council, I'll just ch chime in here. I, I, uh, I, I really appreciate you looking, looking into this, and, and under most circumstances, it's probably a good idea, but I'm, I myself am content to leave this as a special exception, uh, mainly because I, I don't see it happen a lot, and I think that it may open up some opportunities for some things that you don't want to see to come come in there yeah. and you may end up shooting your own self in the foot Sounds uh, right. you, you okay with that okay, okay let's go ahead and, uh, let's move along to schools non-commercial all right this is your Benita Springs Fitness and Preparatory Academy and the reason why I took a picture of this is because the schools that we're discussing are not Lee County District schools they are either charter or private schools K through 12, uh, not trade schools, bartending schools. Those are 
not included here. It's basically uh, Bishop Vero, um type operation. So charter school schools aren't considered to be With commercial. Correct. Commercial is going to be trade. Okay. To make a simple connection. Trade schools, beauty college. Yes, sir. Welding. And yeah, 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 the whole thing. <laughs> Welding. Well, that's very good. <laughs> Old school. Steve. Yeah, okay. Old school. <laughs> this, this has to do with basically charter schools and private schools. And so your, your proposal was to do that administratively as well? Yes, sir. And the reason why is because um, Lee County the School Board currently has the ability in every zoning district to locate a school. This would simply provide the same opportunity for a charter school or a private school. Yeah. So, so when the, when the Lee County School Board, I'll come right to you. When the Lee County School Board uh, makes an application, they have their own rules, right? It, they generally don't tend to make applications, sir. Yeah, they generally don't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. No, Peter, and you're Peter. saying you want to do that administratively, mm -hmm. internally, for at, the at for the use. Now, they would still be required to file a development order application, which is more than no, I, I the understand. school district does. I, I guess I would respectfully disagree and think that should become before city council. Would you like that as a special exemption? require, okay, special exception? Mm-hmm. For Lee County School District? No, this is, non, uh, this is yeah, for non-commercial schools. Uh, Mayor. Yes, uh, um, we'll go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just two things. Schools, non-commercial, I think they need to go through zoning. Just, you know, uh, we had a situation, the DRGR, which you know okay and then um, I'd like to see schools commercial for agricultural uses so if somebody wants to teach beekeeping or have a stable for horses or if that's covered under something else is stable is a riding Academy we might not have under state law the ability to have a riding Academy no, is to, under to the regulate. right to farm regulate. To regulate. okay very good so under the right to farm you would be able to have uh, instructions on. I. I would not know that it, it. Yeah. If you've got an existing agricultural operation, and you've also, in addition to that existing agricultural <laughs> operation, that's a bona fide agricultural use, have instruction. I don't think you're going to be able to regulate. Well, if you have a standalone yeah. instructional, that is not a bona part of a bona fide agricultural use. That's when you can start looking at at different regulations. Okay. Then would a riding academy be you know we love kids we're losing the ability to go horse out and ride it somewhere so to have a stable and riding academy is it part of a is it part of an active uh ranch you know it's so uh, it depends on what else else is going on in the property as to what type of controls you can place on site well you might have experience with this in pine ridge they have a riding academy they have a stable along goodlit road you probably drove past it and Do seen I look it like an equestrian? you look like an equestrian Better than the, the bottom part of an equestrian. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, how do we allow a riding academy there without having to attach it to a ranch? Because eventually, we're becoming suburban. We'll be urban. Uh, it might the ranch might go away as ranches here have. And how do we allow the riding academy or the beekeeping thing or the whatever maintain its use without cutting off the you know yeah. councilman if you would allow me to bring that back to you at a later hearing <laughs> so I can make sure that I's are dotted and T's are crossed because there are going to be some things that we need to make sure we don't try to regulate in areas so that we don't have the authority absolutely to regulate. my pleasure thank okay, you. okay so uh, to the point here uh, um, Pete I think what you've uh, uh, councilman what you've uh, want to do this by special exception schools non-commercial by special exception is that correct correct and uh, everyone is okay with that yes. okay <clears throat> and you will at a future date uh, come back and give us an opinion about whether we have the, even the ability to regulate agricultural type uses that are arguably schools or Educational whatever. Or instructional. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Good? sir. All right. Carry on. All right. Farmers markets. This was a portion of the comprehensive plan amendment that you transmitted, and the proposed text in the land development code. Just to kind of go through it briefly. What you're looking at is the authorization of the use within uh, commercial and industrial districts. Uh, council would still approve these uses through a special event permit, but the use itself would be uh, legal. You're limiting, or we are proposing that you limit the number of privately operated farmers markets to two at any one time. And uh, the language that's in front of you also includes standards for cleanliness, hours of operation, 
um, how a site will function, restroom facilities, so that when you go to a farmer's market, you can expect certain things to be in place like you would a normal business. I don't know if there were any questions. My notes were a little bit vague on this section, so if there's any areas you would like me to go into in any more detail. All right, any questions about this? Yes, yes, Mayor. You're all, you're all good with this? Oh, yes, just a, go right ahead, uh, John, just clarification. Uh, farmer's market, so if we operate promenade and we do our city one, there can't be another farmer's market at the same time? Same day. Same day? You can have two privately uh, operated farmer's markets simultaneously. But if you look at, at the regulations in what can be sold and defined as a farmer's market, I don't believe that the promenade location would fall under that definition mainly because of the types of products they sell. Uh, farmer's market is going to be food related and it's not going to be more of a craft uh, variety. Okay. 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 E explain. Uh, per it's a permitted use within commercial and industrial zoning areas. And explain that permit process and the people who will be issuing those permits. There will still be a special permit required? They will be coming to you for a special event permit. Special event permit, as they do now. As they do now. But the use of a farmer's market, which is not currently included in your land development code, including definitions and standards of operation, uh, we've included those here, okay. along with identifying that the use is, is permitted with a special event permit. So, so, so under this, you know, we would have some control over it because they, they would have to come here and apply mm -hmm. for the special event permit mm -hmm. again. Yes, so sir. that way, if we, we wouldn't end up with a proliferation, we'll say, we, we could kind of throttle that back. Yes, sir. You would keep the numbers under control. You would also, under the proposed language, uh, have the ability to monitor the site, to ensure cleanliness, to ensure that the site is functioning. And you would also have the ability to, to approve the special event permit when it comes before you so okay. if an operator does not operate well one year if they come back for you for another farmers market you would have the ability to review and judge accordingly okay Pete is this can we take public comment on this or solicit Barbara did you want to say something on this or I guess actually I would that be okay at this we'll, time we'll, or we'll take public comment at the um, okay at at before we vote on okay. this perfect thank you Okay, uh, any, any questions so far as, as that? And we're, we're good. All right, let's go ahead and go on to the next one. Okay. This is another section of your code that is in need of updating. Um, I don't know if this ever was changed from the original writing. Uh, what we're looking to do is to keep residential fences and commercial fences and residential project walls. There will now be a requirement to keep them in good repair. Uh, if you have a residential project fence, we want you to keep the good side of that fence out so the uh, functional portion of that site is in towards the property. Uh, we also, the uh, reason why I took these pictures is because for a residential project fence, there is no requirement for the uh, uh, landscaping on the outside of the wall. So, so I didn't embarrass anybody. I took a picture of the city's wall with no landscaping and then another project wall that if was your nice. intent was not to embarrass somebody that's not working <laughs> oh, my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this kind of compares what the current regulations are towards a little bit more of what we're requesting from the council okay um, so so at this time when you see these residential developments they could actually put their buffing on the buffering on the inside of the fence right now on the front, no, sir, but when you get to the back and the rear of the site is where they have a little bit more flexibility. So it won't, won't affect the kind of what people usually visually see. It'll be the neighbors on the sides that may see this big blank wall. Yes, They'll sir. be required to put, put landscaping on the outside. And what really brought attention to this was a controversial project to remain nameless that proposed a wall around the entire facility, and there was no requirement for landscaping there. So no. as a result of learning that lesson we wanted to bring this forward so the council or no no requirement that the buffering itself be on the outside of the fence or the sides in the rear of the property or the yes, sides sir. in the rear of the property yes, okay sir. understood and you also will have proposed language in there for agricultural fences and what can be controlled and what can't be now that we're looking at allowing agricultural in portions of the city we probably need to have standards for agricultural fencing stating what we can do and what we cannot do and that is included in your proposed text Okay, and uh, so so far as private single-family residential, are, are you are you planning on having buffering any type of plantings in front of that, or this is just for planned developments? 
just for residential project expenses. If you have a single family house, you would be able to do what you can do today. S same regulations in terms of height and location. Right. What really changes is the requirement to keep that fence in good order and keep the good side of that fence out. But the, the, the general properties. public here doesn't, ha doesn't have to plant buffer, no, you know, set the fence back, no, plant buffering on the outside. No, sir. Okay, good. Questions from st council? Yes. Can you just speak briefly to, are you having changes about agricultural fencing? Uh, can you speak about that really quickly? Because there's rights involved with that. Like, well, that's what know. I'm saying. We identified the areas where we could not regulate. And so, let me get you the exact language. Well, just the only regulation yeah. is we're preventing barbed wire within 100 feet of a residential unit. That's a good idea. Uh, for agricultural property. That's the only thing we've really looked at doing. Okay, so as far as hard wire, being able to use that with... You can use it for agricultural purposes. Okay, thank um, you. That's all okay. I want to know. All right, Council, got any problem with any of this? All right. Are we going we gonna, to we gonna make the city, we're going to require the city to, uh, to uh, conform to our own standards? Uh, actually, we excluded ourselves. Right. And the reason for that is not for the obvious. It's because that, we're, be it's it's because we're cheap. Right. It's because we're it's cheap. because yeah, a lot okay. of the walls that the city has put up have been for visual and sound barriers for residents when roadways have been widened. In those cases, more often than not, there's not enough room for a wall and landscaping. So as opposed to requiring something that may or not be able to fit, if it can fit and the city would like to do it, obviously they will. But you cannot create land out of no land. Yeah, nice try, but we'll, we'll, we, the city will have to, uh, we can inflict that upon ourselves. If we yes, sir, choose. you may. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? We okay with this? Mm -hmm. Good. Go ahead. All right. Two more slides, and we're almost finished. This deals with setbacks from bodies of water and decks. Currently, oh, I hope I get the right button and don't turn this off. Um, if your house has to be 25 feet away from a water body. There cannot be anything higher than 42 inches from that in that 25 foot setback. John, I'm sorry, real quick. You said 25 feet. I heard you, but I didn't hear it. 25 feet from what I've done is I've drawn in a little seawall here to make it easier to measure back from that water body to the structure. That is a required setback right now. We've had several people talk about building decks off of their second floor, and for a number of reasons. One, because people like to have decks in their second floor. Another one is we've had a, a few uh, property owners that have purchased older homes and have storage on the first floor because their house is elevated, and their only entrance or exit is the front door. They have no back door. And so uh, with this setback requirement, you can't even put a, a balcony to put stairs to have a rear exit to your house. But I think the purpose of this regulation when it was written was to prevent what everyone's called the canyon effect and to perfect, protect few corridors. So if you're standing in the ba your backyard, your neighbor does not have buildings down to the water body preventing you from looking to the sides of, of your house. To keep that intent intact, what we're proposing is if you build a deck on the back of your house, if you build it to the 25-foot setback line, you would be allowed to build a 10-foot deck, meaning 10 foot into closer to the rear of your property, but 8 feet from grade must remain open. The only thing that can go there are columns that are part of the structural support of that <coughs> deck, and they cannot be wider than 4 inches. So, and this John, I'm sorry again. Believe me, I am. How far do those columns have to go down? What what's code there? What's required? Go down. Well, don't they have to go uh, down for structure into the ground? Yeah, yes, they do. But when they're not going to be visible. Oh no, I, I understand. I'm just curious. I'm not sure. It's whatever the other stand head. building code is. That, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I, there is. You are correct. There is a standard. I think it depends upon the size of the deck as to the depth of the support columns. The weight, the soil factors, there's a lot of factors yep. engineers have to decide yep. to do that. Right. I don't and, believe And there again, I'm just curious, what normally here in Benita, how far down before you hit water? Depends on what portion of the city. I, I, and I know, right, I, right. Some places it's a matter of a couple where, of feet. Where this would be taking place, probably three feet. Yeah, okay. some places could be 10 feet. Well, you know that. <laughs> but three to 10. 
Just a guess. More or less, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a guesstimate, but it's going to be right around there. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is one other thing I wanted to show you. If you have stairs going back to the deck <coughs> or anything that is constructed, we measure the setback line once you reach 42 inches. So at 42 inches is where you need to meet that what will has proposed 15 foot setback from the property line. Does this kind of display a little bit better? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Nice drawing. Thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Steve. Anybody? Uh, <laughs> it is at 130 scale. This council, you have any comments about governments about this? Yes. We allow pool cages up to seven feet, don't we? To near that seawall. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have real mixed feelings about this, uh, strangely enough, um, since it comes under the heading of what I do for a living. But um, I, I understand that, that there's arguably a hardship with some of the existing houses and that kind of thing like this. But if people can do this, they will do this. Yes, sir. I, that's just the way it is. I mean, everybody wants to be as close to the water as they can. Mm -hmm. And currently now, if you built a new house and you design a new house, you would design the, the deck to be at the edge of the 25 feet and you would start back from there. Yes, sir. All right. And, and so, so, but in this proposal, they would be able to go ahead and put their house next to the 25 feet and build within that. Yes, sir. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, um, I don't agree with the 10 feet portion of it because I understand how there, there can be an argument that an existing house, they, they need to put a stairway so they can get out the back. Mm -hmm. But they don't need 10 feet to do that. No, oh, no, sir. Okay. So uh, I would be in favor of, of allowing it to be six feet. That would allow you to put a, an area where you could get outside of your house, right? There could be a tip type of a deck. You could put a couple of chairs out there. But it, it, it wouldn't, I think six feet's plenty. Uh, and, and then you would be able to attach that. So I, I, I would make the argument that's, that six feet would be plenty. And then I think that that strikes... That allows people the, the safety of getting out of their houses, and uh, and it doesn't allow, you know, just everybody to go wild. I don't know, council, and, and I'll go to you. I mean, what's your ideas on this? I was just going to say no. I mean, I, can we? What are your thoughts on what he just said? I guess would be. I, I think it, 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 he's exactly right in the fact that if you want to provide someone access out the back of their house and they have an elevated house, it, it accomplishes that goal. Um, but I think it go, the, the question is, what do you want people to be allowed to do? Um, there's concerns about canyon effects, which may or may not exist. I mean, I can plant uh, eureka palms all along my property line and do more damage to your view than, than what's proposed here. But the mayor is exactly right. If you permit it, someone will build it. So if you believe it is appropriate for someone to construct a deck like we've shown, they will. Good, good. Uh, Janet, go ahead. I guess my question is, is that in a, not in every circumstance are people building the stairs straight out off the back. They're, wouldn't they tuck them against the house and put them perpendicular to right along the house? Well, the reason why I kind of set this up. I, I Just so to illustrate the point of the 42 inches. We have an application us. in our office right now that looks almost identical to this. Okay. And, and um, I showed the, the stairs out this way only because for properties that tend to be a little bit smaller, older lots, older homes, uh, there may not, you either have to do a circular <coughs> staircase or you have to bring it towards the canal. Those are the two options. Uh, but you're exactly right. If you have a little bit more property, you can have several. Uh, right, but we're right yes, along. But, uh, but changing this to six feet doesn't mean that that will, that will make everybody put in a, right. a six foot deck it just means that their house has to be further away from the property to accommodate a bigger elevated deck and there are no that we are not authorizing or proposing anyone be allowed to put a roof or any type of structure over that right but that 25 uh, feet that. area that is the edge of the overhang of the built technically the edge is overhang is, is it the wall is the, the wall. overhang the wall. that's the wall it's the wall yes sir oh okay that's why this is an encroachment into. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and then that 10-foot measurement would be from the wall. Yes, sir. And your 25 feet measures from that to the wall or to the eave? The wall. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you have feet. a standard for how big an eave could be? Three feet. Three feet. Nice. Okay. Any other questions? 
I'll go with What's your, your six, pleasure? I go with your six feet. Same here. Seventy two inches. Is that okay? <laughs> All right, six feet? Sounds bigger. Seventy-two yeah. inches. Yeah, so, Slack just said. <laughs> so if I was doing my subtraction on open deck, the minimum rear setback instead of it being fifteen feet would be nineteen, 19. feet. Is look what at I would you. put, and that look would at be you. My, oh, Well, I have look to figure out how to draft this. So. And in that effort, there are bonus points way. if you can identify the section of this plan. Yeah, she has not come, She has come a long ways with the building code. <laughs> All right, are you okay with that? Yes, sir. All right, good. And you would tell us if we were doing something that was going to be a hardship for somebody? or it, Well, somebody's going to go back and revise a plan, but uh, they're still going to have the ability to. Like that never happens, does it? Oh, no, sir. Okay, all right. Okay, no, Council, we all right with that? Good head nod? All right, carry on, please. This is our last slide, and this is the building that kind of started the shed ordinance rolling. Thanks. <clears throat> um, we received a few phone calls from the neighbors uh, about this, and they weren't particularly pleased of its existence. Uh, this is one of the few instances where I've blatantly stolen something from Lee County in terms of their regulations. What they have done is they've limited the size of sheds in corrugated metal buildings to 240 square feet in residential districts. This is why, because right now there is no maximum standard. So if, um, you know, the council feels that this type of, of building is appropriate or you would like to have people have the ability to put that on your site. We currently have no regulations to, pre to prevent it. Uh, we propose something that would limit the size of those. It's about the size of the average TED shed, Amazon shed, uh, 10 by 12. So you would still have the ability to put a metal shed on your property, but the size of that shed is going to be restricted. Okay, um, I thought I thought we already took care of this, but that's. Uh, I thought right. this was one of the uh, items you wanted to kind of see. I don't pictures remember. Of. Yeah, yeah. Council, are you okay with this uh, limiting the size to of metal sheds, you know, to to uh, two hundred four square feet? Could could we just? I know you said it's like the size of Ted's shed. Have you actually called them? Because I think I've got a twenty-two by twelve. Does that mean I have? Oh, to you take, can buy them larger. I I know, but what I'm saying is that's pretty standard, twenty-two by twelve. Not a 35 foot, you know. That's it's pretty big. Large shed. It's yeah, a large but shed. if you have a bunch of property together, you know, that might be appropriate for what you're doing. But you live in an agriculturally zoned piece of property. This is for residential okay, well, zoned wanna, property. I understand that. Okay, Audrey. I just want to also point out when we talk about TED sheds and such, uh, the LPA was very specific as to materials. So this would apply to corrugated or galvanized steel or similar material. It would exclude the aluminum lap or clapboard style siding. Thank you. So many of the samples you see at TED Sheds would fall under clapboard styles. You know, they look like little cute houses. If you build an accessory structure that doesn't necessarily fall under this, this is metal buildings. And they don't consider aluminum metal? Well, we include aluminum as metal. So what, well, what did you just the say? Aluminum, the aluminum siding that you aluminum got that's supposed to look like. Okay. Yes, sir. That's how about, where you make the distinction. How about metal siding? I'm fine with that. Uh, I, how, would, how would a metal sided building look different than this one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you would like to make that change, Mr. Mayor, I would have you. I'm problem. just saying. Well, uh, aluminum tends to be the common Because it, 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 what, what we're talking about is not whether the structure itself is applicable we're talking about what it looks like yes sir and right. so if you if there's a proposed change so that it's a metal sided building i'm i'm okay because the intent I, I believe is still there well i mean i mean i think we need to try try to somehow architecturally differentiate between what is a um the the aluminum uh standard aluminum or vinyl siding type of thing and what these quonset hut metal structures are somehow within that language i don't know how you're going to do it i don't think we're going to figure it out here but um and i was going to say and i guess in theory right the rubbermaid or some other product any other pro any other product yes sir but you rubbermaid while they i'm sure if i called up rubbermaid today and asked them for a 300 square foot shed they could build one for me but they don't tend to they don't carry it in stock the, you don't tend to be able to purchase that a floor I model. Right, and I guess I was just continuing the point, or any other material. I would say non. Was. I would say non-corrosive material. That way, you the intent is with the aluminum or vinyl siding that doesn't rust, doesn't require maintenance. If you start, 
It, the, the conversation that the LPA had regarding this, so the way they differentiated it was that these metal, metal buildings, right, Gal galvanized metal buildings, right, and that's all they described it as, would be limited to that size, but they exempted the buildings that had the siding, the aluminum siding on the sides. Is that recognize that there were buildings, for example, RV trailers, um, things similar to coal barns, where they might be larger uh, if you plane built, gliders. If you built a detached garage in your property, and you built that detached garage in the same architectural style as your house, we don't want to regulate that in terms of the size. It's if you buy a manufactured um, pre shed yeah. or uh, facility or building, and it is the corrugated metal, that's what we were looking at limiting the size. This is not the only example. There are a couple of other examples where the same uh, size, but an open design was used for carports. And that okay. um, just as a suggestion, why don't, we, why don't we give this language a try here? And I think that's probably the best thing to do. If it becomes a problem or if people start finding loopholes in it, we can always come back and mm -hmm. I think we're making a stab at trying to do away with these. I think that's the best we can do. Martha? Something like architectural residential design that fits in with a residential yeah, someday, whatever. You know. Someday, somehow, so, when yeah. I, if we can get through this. yeah. Right. I can bring something <laughs> back in, at a later date. A way later, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, anything else that you have for us? No, sir, I think that's enough. Okay, council, any questions before we go to public comment? <clears throat> Could you turn the lights up for us, Bill? Sure. Thanks, sir. At this time, we're going to take public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on this chapter four, well, please come forward. Uh, can you put up that uh, deck with the stairs coming down? Uh, how, how hey, Rick, I'm going to ask you to go ahead, and feet. go ahead and speak in the microphone, Rick. Good. Thank, thank eight, you very much. Rick, Rick Steinmeier, only eight feet high. Is that the minimum or maximum? Because uh, if that comes off of the first living floor, uh, especially in some places, the first living floor is 20 feet. And if you made it six feet out, you wouldn't have enough room to run, run a normal. You can't drop 10 feet and six feet in a stairwell. So I don't know if you'd be able, on a six foot, whether you'd be able to build a stairway out through there. And of course, you're not going to, you're not going to enclose that, which I'm sure they'll try to screen it in especially if there's a door going out on the ground floor. Um, <coughs> uh, and what was the last project you were doing? Uh, on the sheds, you have a 12-foot height limit off of what, the grade? Is that specifically? Because you could really put a 250-foot building up, way up over top of something. So yeah, good questions. questions. Good questions. Thank you, Rick. We'll get to those. Next speaker, please. Yeah, Fred Forbes. Uh, I agree with everything that you've talked about. I want to make sure that the uh, something didn't get lost in translation, which can easily happen. Uh, when you were talking about uh, 4-381, initially some of the comments by John Domer was that at the time it would be reviewed, whether it was administratively or city council, that you would, for the first time, <laughs> I might add, look at the uses that are permitted. And then all of a sudden that discussion went from that to intensity and density. The, the devil is in the details. It's that 100 plus uses that get bundled in and the, and the council needs to have that ability to take it out. Audrey's shaking her head and I'm glad to see that. I just want to make sure in the editing you don't leave that. Other than that, I have no problem with what you did. I think you did a fine job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else at this time? Please come forward. Deborah McLean, author of The Banana Peel. I found the discussion about the two farmer markets limitation, the compatibility with promenade or neighborhood to be very enlightening, and I hope that you will apply that with compatibility and use when it comes to homeless shelters and soup lines. I also found it very interesting that the DRG, G, DRI, meaning regional impact, um, 
there was discussion, and I and I I need you to correct me if I'm wrong. But when Logan Boulevard decided it would connect to Benita Beach Road, I think the fire department earmarked a piece of property for a future firehouse, and I am suggesting that if we have a large development, that they earmark not more commercial space. We certainly don't need it, but they should earmark and dedicate for free to us school land for schools, um, private charter schools. Uh, whatever our need is, including additional substations for sheriff, fire, again, private school, charter school, and perhaps hospital. If a, a development is so large that it may impact us on a regional level, then they have to supply regional uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else this time? Please come forward. Good morning. For Barbara. the record, Barbara Barnes Buchanan resident of the city of Benita Springs, and I'm a certified planner, and I was previously or formerly assistant city manager for about eight and a half years. I wasn't intending to comment on this until I was sitting here, um, but on your master concept plan, um, I do practice uh, privately on uh, various small and larger uh, developments, permitting, and things like that. Your master concept plan, uh, currently, I'm not representing a client today. This is just very general. Uh, you're requiring that it come back to you at a time where we are just slowly trying to climb our way out of a major, major economic recession. Uh, so the five-year period is an economic hardship. And I notice that you, you do not have um, economic analysis of some of these actions that you're making. Each time you bring in an application and have it reviewed, and granted, uh, it, it is a planner and an engineer's and a surveyor's uh, wonderful work act uh, to come back in, but you know, you're, you're not stimulating the economy. Um, each time you come in, just a, a real simple review is going to require close to $10,000 if you're really going to come in and, and do it. And you're going to have to address, you have to update the survey, you have to have somebody go back out. It all requires time and effort. So if you're really looking to stimulate the economy here in Benita, I think you need to look at some of the rules and regulations that you're, you're putting forth because you aren't. And you're going to stagnate it. And you're going to have the pockets where these master plan or master concept plans exist. Um, in addition, the city's been incorporated since 2000, the beginning of 2000. Granted, council didn't come in and take seats until April. But most of the master concept plans that you have were approved by the council. They've been approved by you. Now, there, there are maybe a few concept plans out there that were approved by the county before the city incorporated, but the council has looked at it. Maybe not all of you, or maybe some of all of you have. In fact, some of you have. But if you go back, I mean, it's already been looked at. Now, there are some, once again, that maybe you haven't looked at. But, y but you're putting people through uh, more steps. You're going to stagnate the economy, and I don't think that you're sometimes getting a, a total picture of what the true economic impact is of these actions. Uh, and I, as a private planner, cannot truly represent to a potential purchaser the, you know, what the true amount that it's going to take to move a, a vacant project with entitlements to fruition. And I realize the, the my time is short. Um, on the farmers markets, uh, once again, you have approved uh, master concept plans with schedule of uses that indicate what ag uses you can and you can't have. Um, I, th I think you need to continue to uh, try to provide an environment where we have a very uh, competitive economy, and I'm not sure if you really want to prohibit certain areas, and I think it's going to be really hard for staff to administer the farmer's mar market, and invariably when you have the farmer's market, the green market, you get 
green products that may not necessarily be edible. Um, so, so it's a real fine line of what you have out there. And people do like some of the, the fun things. They may look a little tacky, but there are times where it's still fun and it's still of interest to our uh, tourists that come in. I just would like to see us um, keep in the back of our minds that we're really trying to bring our community back together and bring the economy up and try to support people and support businesses. So thank you. Thank you, good for you, nicely done. Uh, anyone else this time, please come forward. Seeing none, a council, what is your pleasure? Would you like to uh, send us on? And before we, um, I have to say, um, I think Barbara is, is right on with this, uh, this economic analysis of it. It's something that, that very rarely, we, we refer to it, but we refer to it in the abstract. We're always talking about whether it's good for economic development or not, but we do it sans proof. And so I think that a lot of times, I think we need to go ahead and get some input along that. Just like when council, before we make a decision, a lot of times we think about what the economic impact is to the city government. We think about that a lot but we really don't really have any facts or figures when it comes to the economic development or the economic impact arguably for the entire community. So I think that's a great comment. Audrey. I just want to point out that the city has always allowed waivers of different items from applications, whether it's the initial application, if it did not make sense. For example, you might not require a small project to do a traffic a TIS study because it does cost a lot of money and it is an engineer's relief act or a traffic engineering relief act. So the city already has that in the process, and during the application process, the, there's submittal, but there, these items could be waived. Now city council could say no to the waiver and make it harder, and that would be city council's call at the time it's coming in. I, council, just a suggestion, and then we'll go ahead and, and see if we can wrap this up. Uh, I think that uh, right now, I think that, uh, I think that we probably will all be content with what we've got going on here. But I, along with Barbara's suggestion, I think that we should go ahead and, and have the EDC or somebody uh, 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 sponsor an economic kind of an impact of what some of these changes and even some of the other development things that we have to go by. There's no reason why our, our community development should be put in a position, quite frankly, of coming up with ideas how you maybe stimulate the economy. We've got, that's what we've got an economic development committee for is to go ahead and make recommendations on how you might do that. And then the community development can chime in on what, what the uh, actual uh, benefit to the community would be or the detriment to the community would be. So maybe we can, we can approach those in a, in, a, in a different venue then. All right, what's, what's your ideas? Would you like to go through with this? Yep. Yes. Send this back to staff to bring it back. I don't. The touches that we've made or I just pass it as conditioned with what we've done here. I, I think that uh, my, help, my personal show, I think that we've pretty much come to a consensus and, mm -hmm. and are you able to go ahead and get this, uh, we can pass this today, is that correct? As long as I read you the changes so that you understand what changes I will be making to this document. And if you you're prepared to do so? with those. I am prepared to do so, I've been taking why, notes. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, on page six, I would be starting on the uh, changes. I would remove the administrative extensions of master concept plans, change the time so there would be a one-time extension up to four years by council. I would also add on section D1, starting on page eight, that the application must include unless waived at a minimum, so that it's very clear that there could be waiver by city council prior to extension, the extension application going forward, if it was something such as the TIS or any additional capacity information if it's not necessary. Okay? Uh, the next changes would start uh, on- Hold on. Yes. Okay, as with, uh, uh, we had a comment by the public, just to make it clear, when we do an yes. MCP or, uh, I don't know about DRI, but uh, we're going to be reviewing the uses, density, and intensity at the five uh, for the economic development part of what your, mm -hmm. your comments were, that we have actually eliminated a review. So yes, we're giving the benefit to the community in that way. It's a balance. It is a balance, and uh, you brought up Mr. Forbes' point, and I'm glad you did. On page nine, I will be keeping the language, so there's no change, but this language is in there, 
Prior to granting any extension, City Council will review uses for compatibility with existing and approved development and may remove uses or add conditions to make the uses consistent with the Benita plan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next would be going to page 13 for the next change. Um, I am not changing, so I'm taking out all the underlines and cross hatches and making it as it was to remain in the ordinances. Uh, police or sheriff's station along with post office. Now I'd like to add the words U.S. so we're very clear we're talking about the government post offices there. Um, I'm going to keep as is, which means a special exception or existing only special exception for private on-site recreational facilities. I'm also going to on, uh, change to special exception and not administrative approval, non-commercial schools. Now uh, I have in my notes that we will take back at another time discussion of stables. We just weren't stable enough to handle that. Hey, come on, guys. I have to have a little humor. What about chicken coops? Sorry. Hey. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not talking about that today. Separate subject matter. Okay. Uh. <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you I, so much. <laughs> on pages 55 and 57, I will be doing my mathematical ability to change minimum rear setback. Right now, it currently says from 15 feet from the rear property line, both for 19. setback and stairs and landing. Um, I'm changing that to a 19 foot rear setback line, recognizing that six feet is the maximum for the setback and the encroachment for these open decks. Okay, uh, to Rick's, Rick had a really good question there that I had forgot to ask there. Um, do you consider this, this, this six foot wide, what's, can, can they put the deck up to the top of the roof or, can, or are you gonna put language in there to where it can be to the floor level of how high up i mean what how are you going to control that you have a minimum of an eight foot clearance so if you're standing in your backyard you will have eight feet that you can still look so through. there's a minimum clearance underneath there there's a minimum but clearance. they can make the deck as tall as they want to you can only have four feet of railing on top of that the only no. adjustments that we will allow for there's a are, minimum but could i just say i want to run the deck off the top of my roof mm -hmm. you still have to meet the maximum height in your zoning district so you're still not going to go more than 35 feet. I don't feet. know if we want rooftop deck areas. I personally I do, one. but uh, you have you, one? Well, you, I have you do it a now. winner's walk in the middle of my... If you place it in the... Look at what she's got. We're on the way. <laughs> Make sure she's up to code. So, um, so, so, so there is no maximum height so there far. There is a maximum height. There is a maximum height. Well, well, the same as the house. Yes, sir. But if you decide to put a, a porch or balcony in the middle of your roof, and you design the house to accommodate that, if you are beneath the maximum height, it's perfect. that's the way it exists now. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, except sir, we would be, be extending it within six feet of the... The only thing we would discuss here, that the change would be that that uh, balcony would be off the back of the house and not on top of the house. So strangely enough, what we're, what we're doing is saying that you can, we need a four, four foot clearance because you're allowed to go, what is it, 42 inches? You're allowed to go 42 inches up, right, in that area, but then it's eight feet clearance underneath there so that leaves four feet just about four and a half feet depending on the design yes sir okay that's it that's complicated enough oh, um, i think we've done our, our work's done here all dris anyway. and well just to go through all the questions real quick yes uh, go ahead mclean had asked about concurrency reviews for dris all zonings and development of regional impacts go through that for public facilities schools fire roads parks that's all part of the review and if somebody is wanting to be lacking based on the level of service the city's established, they either have to provide those facilities or pay the proportion of fair share. Gotcha. And uh, under any situation, whether that porch is there or not, you can screen the backyard up to eight feet from the property line. So yeah. regardless of the- Roof deck. line all the way out to the edge of the water, they could put a gigantic Avery out there if they wanted I to. I think that was all the public comment questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, uh, council, you have any other questions? We prepared to go ahead. Uh, yes. Oh, I just want to make sure you understand what you're doing on 55 because, for example, and I'll use my house as an example. I have open decks, and we had to meet setback. So technically, if I wanted to, I could now change my setback to 19 feet and put the house to the 19 feet and then move another, um, I guess, six feet for building additional open decks. That's how I I'm sorry, this. that says setbacks from bodies of water. Do you live on the water? No, no. page 55, there's two sections, there's okay. 55 and 57. 57 applies to on the water. That would not be applicable to me. Okay. 55 
is the open decks for encroachment section that is read in, you know, and that would apply to all houses that you now could have. I'm just telling you the worst case, I don't think I would do it. I, I mean, I'm just telling you the worst case person kind of scenario. I'm hoping I'm not the worst case person. You kind of now have moved the setback by allowing an open deck a little, well, a little closer. And John. Uh, John, come on up here. Maybe it's my math or my measurement uh, capability. I, I, would, I would suspect so, but go ahead. It's it as you see it. That's it. So you still have 25. Now, now, uh, what she's referring to is some other section that Not has sure. no. Page 55. <laughs> if I wanted to take my open deck and move it out, I wouldn't be able to enclose. You're correct. I, I would meet the 25 setback for the closed space, but for the space that my deck is now, I could build my deck out further. Don't give me a no because I think. Oh, that's okay. Go, you way. carry on. If I wanted to make my deck, say, a wider, bigger deck, I want to have more lawn furniture up there. I want to do platform because I have four decks on my house. I could go out further based on this and be okay on the setbacks. Not on the open water. I'm talking about the none On the rear. Water. On the rear of the house. This does not change the side setback, but if you wanted to extend your porch, patio, deck, whatever you want to call it, Correct. an additional six feet towards the rear of the property. You could. Right. So, so you've also changed this to oh, you've also changed this to where that regular pieces of property. If you, if your rear setback, what's the rear setback on a property? Normally, for residential districts, it's twenty five. On a rear setback, mm -hmm. twenty five. So you've applied this to landward properties as well. Yes, sir. Landward properties as well. But there's two different sections. So if the council feels differently on properties on bodies of water as they do inland properties. One can be approved and one can be uh, denied. Well, Council, I don't know what the difference would be. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask Pete? a question that's probably irrelevant, but <laughs> Please. it's in my mind, so it's definitely irrelevant probably. But uh, if you're down on the beach, and um, I'm trying to buy, it would be just north of the Bonita Bay Beach Club. There is a, I believe it's a greenhouse, and it has one of those overflow waterfalls, kind of like mm -hmm. those. Is there a hot tub or some other body of water up there or is that simply the waterfall cascading down i would have to look at the building plans i don't right i mean it's tub. beautiful but are we do we allow and i know it's heavy and i know it'd be elevated do we allow water up on we do most of those houses that have been currently constructed their pools will be elevated but i'm saying they're like rooftop that's what i'm getting at oh we, rooftop water if we don't have like a water bed. Oh, you're talking like the water bed or the hot tub restrictions where you don't allow a hot tub on a platform. We do not. It's up to the engineers designing the house to have the structural components in place so it doesn't fall. Just so it is right, which what I know it's very, but it is allowed. Yes, sir. On the water or not on the water in town or on the ocean. Yes, sir. That's true. Really, the, the only difference is coastal high hazard issues and height limitations along Hickory Boulevard. Okay. To, to, to Audrey's point. This does apply. If you raise the water there and put a rear setback line, this does apply to rear set to all all properties. There are there are two proposed changes, one right. that addresses water bodies and one that addresses inland properties. And they we would be changing identical. both of those to six feet. They are identical languages, but they are two different sections. So two depending. sections. And the rationale for both applies. Why would one would be there, allowed to do be it a, or not? The body of water there really has nothing to do with it. Yes, sir. Okay. Is, is council okay with the six foot on either one of those? Mm hmm Okay. All right. As long as you understand it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mayor. Yes? Mayor. I'll just say that when you think about having a deck like that on the back of a house on a water body, you're not going to be overlooking your neighbor's, typically, your neighbor's backyard. Now, let's say if you do that inland and you're on, you have, you have a neighbor behind your house and you extend your property, you might be uh, looking over their fence and uh, invading their privacy. So I would be concerned about the inland property, the, the one that's on the water, I understand. You're not going to have somebody living right behind you probably. So uh, that might be a concern for me. And I don't know if we have to be equitable and allow both to do it, but I would think on the water body be fair. I think, I think because my personal opinion, Council will get to chime in here, I think that because it's six feet, and if you wanted to look out your window at people, you could. Anyway, I don't, I don't really see that there's that much difference there. 
I mean, personally, I think that I think that if you're going to allow properties to do that, you're going to allow properties to do that. And I don't see any uh, issues from my perspective, Mr. Mayor. And if we do see issues, you know, we bring them back to you. Council, to are you okay with mm -hmm. applicable to each property? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Head yeah. nods. I'm not. All right. All right. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. You can. Uh, all right. I'll make the changes mm -hmm. accordingly. That's all you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all right. That was that was easy. Okay. Eek. Okay, uh, Council, what's your pleasure? Do you wish to go ahead and uh, approve this as revised, revised and revised and revised? So move. I have a motion to uh, pass the revised edition. Second. Hmm. I have a motion to second. Any other discussion? Do we have the language for the metal buildings? The metal building language did not change. Well, I think that the the uh, the, con the conclusion there, or what the consensus was, was that uh, we're going to give this go to give this a try here, and we're going to work with code enforcement and with community development, and to see if there can be any better job done on Thank this. Thank you, Mayor. And and for everyone, this goes with, for all of this. Any changes we make to land development code, a lot of times if we don't find something that works right, we fix it. Mm -hmm. It's fine. We'll we'll get at it. We've been doing it for 12 years, uh, 13. Anyway, uh, roll call, please. Councilman Longcart? Aye. Councilman McIntosh? Aye. Councilwoman Martin? Aye. Councilman Slavka? Aye. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Councilman Simmons? Aye. Councilwoman Simons? Aye. Okay, and at this time, we're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute break. Would that be okay? John, do you have some? Just, um, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that we're having some issues with the air conditioning. It is being looked at. Thank I was you. hoping yes. that it was issues with oh, the air conditioner and <laughs> not me. And, okay. And for those at home, it's 89 degrees in here. Uh, we're going to take 10 minutes, please. Everybody, 11:45. Be back.